All right, I think uh, we are almost here now. So hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. And my name is Ching Yong, and I will be your host to kick things off before turning it over to Meida, the main organizer of the instant segmentation track. And he will announce the winner of our challenge and the final awards provided by the USA Institute for Creative Technologies. So all in all, we are really excited to have everyone here today. So this is the outline of our workshop today. Uh, first, I will give a brief recap of our Urban 3D challenges. And then I will give an overview of the results. Next, we will have three fantastic keynote presentations. And then Meda will announce the winner of our challenge. And we also have three winner talks for each track after that. So let's get started. One more thing I would like to remind is that you are welcome to raise uh, questions throughout the event. And please type your question in the chat window or raise your hand. And for audience watching the live broadcast, so please feel free to leave your message on the platform. And we will gather the questions together and forward them to speakers. So last year, our Urban 3D Challenge is mainly based on the Sensei Urban Dataset which is a large urban scale photogrammetry point cloud dataset with nearly 3 billion label 3D points. And it consists of large areas from three UK cities, covering about 7.6 square kilometers of the city landscape. And it is reconstru reconstructed by the UAV photogrammetry. And this year, we further introduced a rich annotated large scale photogrammetry point cloud dataset with synthetic and real data. So this STPS 3D dataset covers 16 square kilometers of city landscape with up to 18 semantic class and 14 instance classes. As such, our urban 3D was enriched with a new instance segmentation track this year. So here we show a demo to illustrate how, we, how our STPS 3D dataset is generated. A low sound, low sound, Chinyu. Okay. Uh, with a moment, I will share again. Okay, here we show the demo of our data visualization and the comparison of the data quality. To clarify, the instant segmentation track is based on the synthetic version 3 dataset. And our challenge starts in May and ends in October. During this period, our Urban 3D Challenge has attracted more than 300 teams from all, all over the world to participate, with nearly 500 valid submissions during the competition phase. And here we list several interesting statistics. So the first one is the winner of the semantic segmentation track were not finalized until the last day of the challenge. And also the top five teams also passed last year best results in semantic segmentation track. And uh, certainly the top performed methods in the instant segmentation track has surpassed the baseline. For example, the highest and also the point group by more than 31% in terms of average precision. That's a great achievement. And finally, we found that the team BBG is in the top three in both the semantic and the instant segmentation tracks. And also, they are also the winner of the last year Urban 3D challenge. Okay, next, we come to the keynote presentation sessions. Okay, so the first one, the Dr. Meida will introduce the keynote speakers, the Professor Randa. Okay, Meida, wait a moment. 
Welcome everyone to the Urban 3D Workshop 2022. It is our pleasure to invite Dr. Renda Hill as the keynote speaker for this workshop. Dr. Hill is the executive director of the USC Institute for Creative Technologies. He is a leader in understanding how classic storytelling and the high-tech tools can create meaningful learning experiences. Dr. Hill stares the Institute's exploration of how virtual humans mix the reality worlds. Advanced computer graphics, dramatic films, social simulations, and educational video games can augment more traditional methods for imparting lessons. He oversees a diverse team of scientists, storytellers, artists, and uh, educators as they pioneer and evaluate new ways to deliver effective teaching and training in areas including leadership, cultural awareness, negotiation, and mental health treatment and assessment. Today, Dr. Hill will talk about the quest to build a holodeck and a lot of work USCST has done over the years. Without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Hill. Hello, my name is Randy Hill. I'm the executive director at the USC Institute for Creative Technologies located in Playa Vista, California, near Los Angeles. I want to welcome you to the uh, second challenge on large scale Point Cloud Analysis for Urban Scene Understanding, Urban 3D 2022. And I'm very pleased to uh, be a keynote speaker for this workshop. Uh, for the next uh, 45 minutes or so, I'm going to be giving you a presentation on uh, some the work that our institute has been doing over the last uh, 24 years or so, uh, what we call the quest to build the holodeck. And I think it's very uh, pertinent for this workshop, uh, as you will see. And I hope that it will, if nothing else, uh, entertain you to some degree. Uh, to give you an understanding of the uh, uh, where this all started, it was in the mid-90s. And this was uh, during the time when there was a, a real revolution in uh, computer game technologies, uh, cheap consoles, and uh, in, in high uh, resolution graphics. Uh, and I think that the Department of Defense was looking at that and realizing that there, there may be something that they could leverage there. And so they commissioned a study with the Natural, National Research Council uh, on modeling and simulation and whether or not uh, it would make sense to link the entertainment industry and defense. The outcome of that uh, study was a recommendation that um, the Department of Defense create a university affiliated research center for advanced modeling and simulation. <clears throat> and it would bring together uh, academia and the entertainment industry, along with uh, potentially with defense, defense industry partners and aerospace, along with the DOD, and it was sponsored specifically by the Army, uh, who really wanted to raise the bar in terms of the types of simulations they could create for training and for education. And so the Institute for Creative Technologies was established in 1999, and it had the mission that you see on the screen there, uh, which really boils down to uh, we were uh, commissioned to do research. Uh, in creating immersive experiences that le would leverage research technologies and the art of entertainment and storytelling to simulate the human experience and to benefit uh, the Army in a number of different ways, but specifically for learning and education. Uh, and so uh, the decision was made to put the, the UARC, the University Affiliated Research Center, at the University of Southern California uh, in part because of its location uh, in Los Angeles, which is considered to be, by many, the creative capital of the world. And that's where this is a place where one in eight jobs is somehow connected with the creative industry. And it's a very large industry. It's also the home of a lot of the uh, major uh, studios as well as uh, game companies. The Institute itself uh, was brought together. Uh, and uh, is, was established to perform cutting-edge research in AI, in virtual reality, 3D terrain, computer graphics, learning science simulation, and we were to bring that together with entertainment industry expertise to create uh, that next generation of interactive digital media. Now, 
So that begs the question, you know, how, and this is the question that we have been uh, pursuing as a research institute uh, for all of our history in some form or another. And it's how do you create an immersive experience with interactive digital media? Now, there are a lot of sources of inspiration for this. And if you think about it, uh, uh, science fiction writers and, and movie uh, creators have explored this topic for years and have inspired uh, a lot of the things that actually have happened in laboratories around the world. You think about the Matrix. Now, that was uh, you know a place where they created uh, simulated experiences, but it involved uh, jacking into the human brain in some form, which uh, sounds great uh, in a movie, uh, not very practical at this stage. Ender's Game is another source of inspiration and actually uh, has uh, some of the elements of, I think, what uh, people would like in terms of a training environment. Because uh, if you've seen the movie or read the book, you realize that uh, Ender uh, mastered tactics in this battle station training area uh, in zero gravity, uh, where they learn to uh, work as teams and uh, and then they actually uh, conducted operations in a game like a simulation environment. Um, so there are some threads there that that are that are useful from an inspiration point of view. And more recently, uh, the movie Ready Player One uh, came out. And <clears throat> if you've seen that movie or read that book, uh, you would remember that uh, there was this uh, this world called the Oasis. It was a vast environment where people could escape by putting on their VR headset and their haptic uh, feedback devices. And uh, the Oasis, which stands for Ontologically Anthropocentric Sensory Immersive Simulation. So it, it kind of has a lot of the things that you might want uh, for a, an immersive uh, experience. And, you know, and if you've seen the movie, you've seen they, the uh, the characters have avatars. Uh, there are other uh, non-player characters, uh, AI-driven characters, and uh, it was highly realistic uh, uh, place. But the place where we've uh, taken our inspiration is from the holodeck, and uh, this is in part because uh, our initial executive director, a uh, name man named Richard Lindheim had been an executive at Paramount Pictures and had worked extensively on the Star Trek Next Generation uh, series. And uh, so the holodeck, which was created there, uh, was this, this room on a uh, starship where, uh, you know, it just uh, normally just looks like a regular room, but when you turn it on, you know, it very quickly becomes uh, this uh, environment uh, where you it's, seemingly infinite in size and uh and it had all the sensory inputs to make it feel real um now the the advantage that the the star trek uh uh crew had and and these scientists was that they had figured out the physics of being able to actually create objects uh, from nothing and um uh, and so we haven't gotten there in terms of our physics, but there's a lot of interesting ideas there that, you know, we should consider when we think about creating an immersive experience. Uh, and, you know, I think that the four components I'm going to talk about today are uh, that begin with just how do you create the sensory immersion? And I'm going to talk about some of the different experiments and ways that we have uh, worked on that at ICT. Uh, but I think what's also uh, interesting, if you uh, think about the holodeck experiences that were shown on the on the series, was that it wasn't just going in there. I mean, yes, you could go in there and practice maybe some martial arts or something like that. But in many cases, there was some kind of a story involved, interactive narrative. And this is one of the uh, things that uh, I think even in the initial study, of uh, that was put on by the National Research Council is that they've, you know, they identified that not only do you want to be able to create uh, an immersive experience, but it, part of that immersion is in the mind and that humans are wired to uh, enjoy and remember stories. 
Uh, and so that has to be a very important component of, of an immersive environment that you create. Creating an interactive narrative is even more challenging uh, because, you know, typically stories are linear, uh, but when you begin to interact with it, it be quickly uh, becomes quite complex. I'm going to also talk about our work with virtual humans, whether they're AI controlled or they're avatars that are controlled by a human through some sort of face replacement, body replacement, uh, in the work that our Vision and Graphics Lab has done. And then uh, end by talking about a, you know, a topic that's very related to this workshop, high resolution, dynamic uh, visual content. And the whole, basically, uh, the uh, holodeck engine that you need to uh, to run that. So uh, it's very related to the labs that we have within the Institute. We have a, a mixed reality group that has been around from the very beginning. And here you see a picture of Mark Bolas, who was the leader of the lab for many years and is uh, one of the really the fathers of virtual reality. Um, we have an interactive narrative group led by Andrew Gordon. Uh, vision and graphics lab uh, that's had a very uh, some very famous researchers starting with Paul Debevic and then Hao Li and most uh, recently Yaji Zhao uh, and then a virtual humans and AI group uh, led by a variety of researchers including John Gratch and Stacy Marcella uh, um, Arno Hartolt uh, and a number of others and then we have uh, a a lot of work that's being presented at this workshop is related to this workshop in 3D terrain. Uh, the idea behind this one world terrain construct began at ICT a number of years ago and has now been adopted um, as a, a standard construct for the Department of Defense. And then we have uh, a number of integration platforms and this effort's being led by Arno Hartolt and uh, Ed Fast. Uh, so, and that's, these are all uh, groups that play into what I'm about to present. So let's begin with sensory immersion. Uh, wind the clock back to 2000, uh, the very first uh, sensory immersion experience or immersive experience that we created at the Institute was in our, what we call the virtual reality theater. It had a curved screen that was about 120 degree uh, field of view. So if you sat, you know, close enough, it really filled your field of view. And uh, it had it used three projectors, uh, very high end projectors that, you know, worked seamlessly together to create the vision that you would see on the screen. Uh, the the engine behind it was a an SGI reality monster. At the time, it was a million dollar computer uh, that we purchased to to run the AI for these virtual humans and all the animations and everything else. And we also had a, a, a first of its kind 10.2 audio system uh, that had been designed by a guy named Chris Kiriakakis at USC. And uh, so when you stepped into this environment, we had created an interactive narrative uh, using a Hollywood writer to, uh, to script out this nonlinear story uh, and then our AI and uh, graphics groups worked on creating these characters. And the scenario was that uh, you, uh, as a participant, were a lieutenant and uh, you're in the Balkans here, and this is in the 90s. Uh, you, you're, this Humvee that belongs to your unit has just had an accident with a car and a, a boy has been injured. Uh, there's a crowd gathering across the street that's very upset. Uh, there's media there and you're put into a position of having to decide what you're going to do. Uh, and it was uh, uh, an interactive system in the sense that uh, you as a participant would speak into a microphone, talk to that sergeant who's standing in the front. And uh, But the, the realism was brought on not only by the graphics, but by the amazing audio and the sound experience because... <clears throat> The helicopter, as it flew over, would literally shake the theater. Uh, the mother would be rocking on her knees, uh, crying. You could hear the the uh, the Humvee creaking as you drove up to the scene, and uh, then you could hear the crowd shouting in the in the in the distance there. And so it was a very immersive experience. 
but it, you know, as we uh, ran that experience, you know, we discovered, you know, there are certain limitations to it. It really only would train one person at a time. Uh, we were also encountering the difficulties of, uh, of dealing with interactive narrative in terms of the number of different branches that you can end up going down or creating. And, um, uh, and you know, it wasn't going to be adequate for training a lot of people at once. And so the next uh, thing that we tried was uh, to borrow an idea from Hollywood, which was that, you know, rather than creating a fixed place uh, theater, like the virtual reality theater, you really wanted to use flats like Hollywood uses to create rooms and streets and buildings uh, just by these movable walls that they would paint and texture to look uh, like the real thing. And this is what's used in uh, typically any TV series you watch or any uh, in, both indoors and outdoors. And the idea, though, in this case, was to project images onto those flats so that you it would be very dynamic and uh, and quick to change. Um, so, uh, you know, this overcame some of the limitations of the, the initial experiment we had with VR theater, uh, where now you could have multiple participants, they could see each other, you could walk in that environment, and it was a mix of uh, the real and the virtual. And so here's a scene, for instance, of a room that we built, where you could see outside, uh, a terrorist could walk up to the door, uh, shoot a weapon in there, and then on the left-hand side, you see bullet holes that would form uh, on the wall when he shot, um, they were projected on onto that wall. Uh, again, it was very immersive and you could have multiple people uh, in that space uh, potentially. And so here are a couple of other scenes from Flat World. Uh, and you can see, uh, you know, the different types of things that we could put, project onto the screens from the rear. Now, uh, you know, one of the limitations of that environment, of course, was that, you know, those characters that would show up on the walls would uh, be 2D and they would, it, it would be difficult to see who they were actually looking at. Uh, and so, uh, you know, kind of a another experiment that uh, the Mixed Reality Lab did was to look at, hey, what if we mounted the projector onto each individual's head and they could get a, a perspective, you know, from their own point of view. And that projector would project onto a retroreflective screen. Uh, and so that each person would get their own individual view. And here's a video I'll run. You may, it may run okay on Zoom. We'll see, uh, but you'll get the idea. Please, Chang Yi, who in here. Here. So you can see that each of these two people have their own, on the bottom screen there, have their own head mounted projectors, and there's a retroflective screen in front of them. Uh, what you're seeing on the top is each person's view, and uh, and then was that character pointed to each of them, uh, they would raise their hand. And so they had uh, a sense of uh, uh, who they who the character was looking at because of this personalized view. So that was an interesting experiment. Um, uh, but then we were challenged by the army uh, and our uh, program manager or some of the program managers at the time to look at a different problem. And what this was that uh, how they, the question they posed to us was how can we lower the cost of a head mounted display for VR? Uh, the the wide five uh, viewer that you see there, I think, cost about sixty five thousand dollars a piece, and one of the head mounted displays that the army was experimenting with at the time uh, cost about fifteen thousand dollars a piece. And so, to outfit a squad with uh, head mounted displays would have cost over a hundred thousand uh, dollars, just based on the head mounted head mounted displays alone. Uh, so. Mark Bolas and the team there began to experiment with this new technology that's coming out in portable phones, which was you had these high resolution displays that were, uh, uh, you know, could be uh, tracked or uh, 
you could change perspective based on rotation. And what they did is they mounted them on a board, put a couple of cheap lenses on them, and uh, and voila, you had a VR head mounting head mounted display. Uh, they took this idea a, a step farther and created this uh, apparatus called a field of view to go or FOV to go, which was a do it yourself immersive viewer. It's a foam core fold up, fold up that you would slip your iPhone into. And then we had some content that you could look at in stereo and, you know, had these cheap, again, lenses that were like a dollar a piece uh, that you would slip in there. And suddenly you had a VR viewer and it, it, as you rotated it, it would change the view in the, in the viewer. Uh, we also experimented with a number of other um, <clears throat> form factors and ways of uh, taking advantage of this technology included this thing at the bottom called the socket HMD. And, you know, the bottom line was that, yes, we could bring the cost down of, um, of a head-mounted display, you know. And, again, the high-end ones were, you know, $45,000, uh, But with the socket HMD, you could bring the price down to $300, which if you um, – you looked at the cost in terms of dollars per degree. It was like three dollars per degree versus the high end, which is six hundred fifty dollars per degree. Now, um, you know the end of that story is that uh, that field of FOV to go product actually won an IEEE uh, prize in 2012, um, and uh, Google uh, basically copied the design and gave us credit for it in 2014. The Google Cardboard. Uh, and then a one of the lab uh, research assistants uh, decided to, uh, he wanted to create a Kickstarter uh, with this technology for head-mounted displays. His name was Palmer Lucky. He created a company called Oculus and sold it to Facebook. And it is now, you know, a um, it's one of the dominant head-mounted displays on the market. Um, and again, it brought the price down. I mean, these things are. Uh, you know, between three hundred and five hundred, eight hundred dollars a piece, and so we achieved our purpose uh, in that. You know, it's a question still of uh, how its use, and uh, we could talk. You know, maybe I'll talk about that a little bit later too. Um, uh, but then, you know, I guess the final thing I'll say about uh, creating an immersive experience really looked at an operational use of VR and augmented reality and mixed reality uh, where we put trackers on person's hands and head and we created a, uh, a surface that could be a control panel on a Navy ship. And uh, from this, using this VR system, he could switch his view to outside of the ship and be controlling a drone or looking farther ahead or looking at different parts of the ship and then uh, controlling operations by touching the screen, which was represented both in the VR headset as well as, you know, having an actual physical surface where he could uh, manipulate controls. And this was, again, an interesting experiment that the Navy is still, I think, uh, 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 looking at. So uh, that's all I'll say now for sensory environments, uh, but it gives you an idea of some of the experiments that we've run over the years. Now I'd like to turn to how to create an avatar, how to create a, a character that looks as real as possible. And an avatar, in this case, I'm talking about something that will be, uh, you know, it typically would be controlled by a human, um, but it's their, their, how they will appear in a simulated environment. So um, turns out that one of the secrets of creating a highly uh, realistic looking object or face or body in a uh, virtual environment of any kind is by modeling how uh, light reflects off the face or off the surface of the object. And Paul DeBevic, who was the first uh, director of our graphics lab, uh, began his research by 
uh, basically uh, capturing pictures of a person's face under every possible lighting condition. Uh, and that's and then you would have a big database of how that actor's face would appear lit from every position. Uh, and what you see on the left there is a kind of a time lapse uh, photograph. What he had was one light on a gantry that would go around, uh, and you could see a picture of it here. It would rotate around the character and then get them from different angles, but the uh, the human had to sit there very still while being photographed uh, over time from every possible angle, and under and then they would capture him uh, with every uh, lighting condition. Now, what uh, the secret then is to uh, to relight a face uh, that you're going to put into a specific environment. By capturing the light in that environment, and you see left there a ball that's uh, that's uh, capturing the light in a in different environments. And once you have that model of how the light is being dispersed in that environment, then you can choose which uh, image uh, and lighting condition in which to model that face, and then you can relight it according to the lighting of you know your target environment. So. Uh, that was very successful, but you know uh, what we wanted to do is make it uh, even more efficient and uh, higher resolution. Uh, so light stage two, again, time lapse foot photograph. This was a large semicircular arm with lights on it that would go uh, rotate around uh, the subject who's being photographed. Uh, this was used. Uh, in the creation of characters for Spider-Man 2 and King Kong, uh, Spider-Man 3, and a uh, curious case of Benjamin Button were recorded in subsequent versions of our light stage, light stage 3 and light stage 5, where we created a basically a globe uh, filled with these LED lights that would strobe very rapidly uh, and had high-speed cameras capturing photographs of the subject uh, under every possible lighting condition uh, that were could be created very rapidly. Uh, light stage, well, LSX, light stage 10. Uh, again, more lights, uh, colors. Uh, so you have more of a spectrum of, of light and polarizers that were put on there to make it even more efficient in terms of uh, being able to capture is reflecting off of the skin and, and seeing the subsurface of the skin as it really is. And, and having very high resolution photographs that came out of that, uh, you know, down to the poor level so that you would be able to replicate a face uh, very effectively. Um, so, you know, some of the products of that uh, were used by Hollywood to create characters uh, such as uh, Zoe Saldana's character in Avatar. And this actually garnered Paul DeBevic a, uh, an Academy Award uh, in, for Science and Technology uh, for for this work. Uh, ironically, Ender's Game was actually uh, they brought the actors in and scanned them for for that movie. And here you have uh, scenes from Logan to show how they you know they created a younger version of Logan. Um, you know, you know, it was played by Hugh Jackman. We scanned Hugh Jackman. Um, and then replaced his face on this other character, this other actor who was walking down the stairs. We didn't do it. The Hollywood people uh, that we handed this to uh, did this work. But, you know, part of uh, what we, you know, have done in the light stage is we have uh, not only just taking a picture of them in a neutral pose, but actually use the face, the facial action coding system to capture lots of different expressions of a face uh, under all those lighting conditions. And it takes, you know, about a half an hour to capture all these different expressions, but then it provides the animators with something to work with uh, when they actually want to animate this. Now, the challenge uh, from, you know, so this has been used effectively, uh, you know, and we've got credits in about 40 movies now, uh, the Vision and Graphics Lab does. But, um, <clears throat> You know, it was still, it's still a uh, labor intensive process. It, 
it's not uh, that you just take a picture, uh, a bunch of pictures, and then uh, can rapidly do this. It was, you know, a process that could take months to actually uh, uh, do the capture and then uh, rig the person and animate them and 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 then uh, put it in the movie. Uh, so what we did in 2012 uh, was uh, we wanted to prove that you could actually do a real-time version of the animation. And working with NVIDIA and Activision, uh, we um, were able to accomplish that. We, we captured the researcher you see on the left there and created what we called Digital IRA, uh, which is a real-time uh, version of that person uh, who, you know, they could animate. And that's what you see on the right is uh, a total digital replica of him. So you can just see how much uh, reality you can you can bring to the table. Now, again, um, we wanted to even take this farther. And so uh, with the emergence of deep learning and machine learning techniques, we thought, okay, uh, what can we do with that? If we create a large database of faces, face types uh, under all these different conditions, you know, perhaps uh, we can use this to, number one, shorten the pipeline uh, and make it more efficient so this totally automated uh, so that you go from capturing someone in a light stage to animating them in, uh, in a relatively short amount of time. Um, but also it gives you the ability to create uh, morphable uh, models of, of uh, a person so that you can create a different identities, an infinite number of different identities from that database. And here you see uh, the morphable model work that we've done, uh, where now you can change the shape of the face and uh, very easily. Uh, and again, it's based on the fact that we have this large database of, of faces now that we can work with. And using machine learning techniques, uh, very quickly go from, in some cases, going from a photograph to a 3D model of, of that character uh, based on what it, know, it can learn from uh, the database of faces. So, you know, that's, uh, that's a summary of the work we've done with uh, creating avatars. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're really, we have a large uh, investment in creating virtual humans, which are these AI-driven uh, interactive characters that, with whom you can have a conversation. And over the years, we've created a whole slew of different applications uh, with these characters, ranging from uh, 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 the digital twins you see up in the, the top with the red coats on, the two girls who were actually uh, docents and, and a museum in a museum of science in Boston for and has been viewed by hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, we've uh, created uh, characters for interviewing for a job or for uh, for teaching leadership skills and, and counseling. And I'll talk a little bit about those, but this is just a, a few. Of, these are a few of the virtual humans that we've built over the years. And the architecture uh, looks a little bit like this. You have the human user and the automated character. We use a speech recognition system that feeds into the natural language understanding. Uh, but we also have an audio visual system, uh, multimodal perception system that's looking at uh, things like uh, the, uh, oops, there we go, uh, looking at the, uh, your facial expressions, listening to the prosody of your voice, uh, your body language, and feeding that into the cognition system. And then uh, some sort of a response is generated from the natural language uh, system. Uh, which generates some speech, but you also have a nonverbal behavior generator that goes with it that, so that uh, it's not just the speech that's coming up, but the, uh, the body language and uh, the facial expressions that go with it. Uh, and so this is what the architecture looks like. And we have a toolkit that we have developed uh, over the years to make it easier to, uh, to create one of these virtual humans. Um, 
So if you think about, uh, as we think back on various milestones that we've had in terms of creating interactive characters, one of the first ones that was really a big hit was this character named Sergeant Blackwell, who would answer questions about the army. And uh, and he was a <clears throat> he was a humorous character. Uh, had a great sense of humor uh, and told jokes and cracked up. And we first demonstrated him at the Army Science Conference in 2004. Uh, but uh, he was subsequently selected by the Cooper Hewitt Museum in New York City in their triennial uh, design competition uh, for display there. And uh, it, he, it was viewed by uh, probably 100,000 people. And we collected about a half a million utterances uh, and interactions uh, that uh, he had with uh, people who would come through the museum. <laughs> uh, another character we created, uh, this is Sergeant Garza for an application called Elite for the Emergent Leader Interactive Training Environment. And in this system, uh, the goal was to uh, provide the human user with the uh, practice environment for holding a counseling session. One of the challenges for young leaders who enter the military is that they are often supervising. Uh, they could be, if they're a second lieutenant, maybe supervising people who are older than them or have more experience of, with them in the Army. And often as a lieutenant, you haven't had a lot of uh, opportunities to uh, be in a situation where you can count, where you counsel someone else. And so um, this system was created uh, where we would uh, elite, we, we would uh, provide training first on how to have a counseling session, how to, you know, uh, be an active listener and to ask the right kinds of questions. And then we'd put you into a situation where you would be actually interacting with this uh, virtual human and a mixed reality type of environment. And it looks very realistic. This character would be sitting across the desk from you and uh, present a problem of some kind. Could be a performance problem or could be a personal problem. And uh, you would go through uh, a series of interactions with them. And then you get some feedback at the end. And a very effective system, but it's also, and we've also used it for uh, getting into other uncomfortable topics, such as if a subordinate comes in um, with a uh, complaint about, for instance, sexual harassment and how to deal with sensitive topics like that. Uh, and the, another example I will mention is uh, a project we did with the Showa Foundation at USC. Uh, this is uh, the, the goal or mission of the Shoah Foundation is to record the histories of the Holocaust uh, survivors. And uh, what we've created here is uh, we've is an interactive interview system where a Holocaust survivor sat for a couple of weeks being interviewed, uh, probably a couple of thousand uh, question answers, uh, questions and answers were uh, recorded on video. These uh, video recordings were then uh, spliced into, you know, it's their component parts. And then we use an AI system for matching questions that a user might have to a suite of different answers uh, here. And it's very uh, compelling uh, type of system. It was, you know, it's been, um, uh, highlighted on 60 Minutes, if you know that CBS program. Um, and uh, we've recorded a dozen different Holocaust survivors. And we've also now moved into the area of recording the survivors of sexual assault uh, for use in uh, training uh, victim advocates and sexual assault response coordinators uh, on how to deal with these sensitive topics. Um, so it's... Uh, been a great system. It's not uh, using graphics uh, research per se, uh, other than the fact that we recorded it in a light stage. All the video was recorded in a light stage. and So you can look at it in VR from different perspectives. 
uh, because we uh, videoed it from uh, different angles. Uh, but um, but it's an actual video that you're looking at. That way, it couldn't be uh, manipulated in some way. And uh, people thinking that, um, yeah, it wasn't the real person. So very compelling uh, system. <clears throat> so the last, well, one of the last big topics I'm going to talk about, and again, it's relevant to this workshop, is the creation of high-resolution dynamic visual uh, environments. Uh, and so for the last, uh, I don't know, six or eight years at ICT, we've had a project that started out and has, it's uh, in in uh, it's morphed into a big DoD program called One World Terrain, but we just think of it as a 3D terrain capture uh, program. Here is uh, uh, a picture of the USC campus that we captured with a uh, with a drone, um, and uh, and it was we've also fused that information with Bing data, which is the big. Microsoft uh, database of uh, of uh, kind of medium resolution uh, capture that was done, and um, we have taken that you know the step farther so that now uh, we're recording not only exteriors of buildings but also interiors, uh, and so that you know you when you uh, bring this kind of uh, 3D information into a simulation environment, you can actually walk into the buildings, which is an important uh, feature from our perspective. Uh, of course, um, you know, there are many different ways of capturing this information. And I'm sure that uh, you, all of you in this workshop are familiar with this, you know, ranging from photogrammetry uh, multispectral, uh, LIDAR, point clouds, and, and synthetic. Uh, but, you know, you can think of so many other ways that we were going to want to collect information about the Earth uh, and all these other spectra uh, that ev eventually we'd want to be able to fuse into a uh, simulation model. And that's where how we're going to create that world that uh, we talk about, you know, that we... Uh, we heard about in the holodeck where you walk in, you create an environment that looks like it's real, uh, and that's exactly what we want to be able to do. Um, but we've also done a lot of work on deformation of those environments, so that if uh, uh, there's an explosion that takes place, it will deform the the building based on the types of materials in it, and this is Again, part of that urban 3D, you know, scene understanding, uh, and uh, so it, you know, it requires us to understand, you know, from the, the sensor data that's collected, what type of material uh, it is, and what the properties of the material are, and how they're going to respond to uh, some kind of uh, violent event that causes it to be deformed. Now, the last big thing I'll talk about, though. It sort of circles back to, uh, you know, if you think about Ender's Game as a, a metaphor for the kinds of worlds where you're uh, you're performing operations of some kind. You know, what we really want we for the holodeck is we need some kind of an integration engine. We don't want to just have pretty pictures uh, that we're looking at, uh, but we want to be able to interact with that environment, uh, translate the environment that we've captured into uh, some kind of a physical representation that physics works on and that we can have an, that we can interact on. And so we have this system called RIDE, Rapid Integration Development Environment, that allows us to do that. And the basic idea behind RIDE is that there are lots of game engines out there that already have a lot of the 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 uh, the physics engines and other uh, uh, kinds of utilities if you would want to have uh, for a simulation environment. So there's no need for us to reinvent the wheel, but we can just take advantage of them um, and uh, both in terms of visualization and uh, in terms of uh, those uh, ability to, to create compelling simulations. Uh, but then, um, 
you know, there's this middle layer we needed to build to it if we wanted to be able to uh, control uh, events within that game engine. So, you know, at the Institute, we have lots of AI projects that uh, can control virtual humans or uh, that where we want to be able to integrate uh, that 3D terrain that we've captured into that engine so that it can be visualized and then we can run uh, other kinds of tools over it. Uh, and so RIDE provides that architecture, uh, both the middleware layer that allows the people doing the research in AI and in uh, different forms of uh, terrain research uh, to uh, be able to integrate it into one of these game engines. We primarily have been using Unity, though we have also done some, some work in Unreal and other game game engines. So uh, here's an example of an army training area uh, that, uh, you know, this is a photograph from this village that's been built out in the desert. Uh, here's some of the images from that. But now we've, uh, we've captured that train, and we've brought it in to ride, and now we can put people in there and uh, conduct uh, army operations in that kind of an environment. Uh, and so these are either avatars controlled by individual people, or they may be uh, non-player characters controlled by some kind of an AI. Uh, we also have these mission planning tools that uh, run on the terrain, allowing you to see uh, if you do path planning and where you're going to be exposed to potential uh, enemy fire. And uh, again, this is um, you know, one of those utilities that it's in, in ride. So the last thing I'll mention is that uh, in 2009, about for a few years there, we developed another uh, virtual reality, mixed reality type system for exploring interactive narrative, as well as uh, the things that we could do with AI. We called it a gunslinger. We created an old West saloon. And in that saloon, uh, we created some virtual characters. We had a barkeeper named Utah. We had a gunslinger who was in town, and uh, and you, as a an actor in this, would come into the saloon, and you're a Texas Ranger, and the gunslinger would say, basically, either you get out of town, or uh, we're going to have a gunfight, and I'm going to leave for a while and and come back, but you better be gone. Uh, what we enable, and by the way, they. They modeled the gunslinger after my face, which I don't know what the message they're trying to give me there. But uh, anyway, uh, so uh, that there are a lot of interesting technologies uh, integrated into that system, uh, including real time multimodal behavior prediction. There were cameras in there that would look at facial expressions and uh, look at you know where the Texas Ranger was looking and uh, could. Uh, analyze uh, nonverbal as well as uh, verbal expressions in that environment. And uh, basically the, the job of the Texas Ranger is while the gunslinger was gone was to go around and talk to the barkeeper, talk to the uh, saloon girl and get some hints about what you should do and how you might be able to beat this gunslinger if you're going to stay there. Uh, and it was uh, a very compelling uh, System. There were a lot of cameras in there, so they could track the little pistol that they used uh, in the gunfight. And uh, if you played it right, you could come out alive. And if you didn't, uh, you would inevitably lose to the gunslinger because he was very fast. But you had to work as a team with the barkeeper. But it was a very uh, uh, interesting interaction to, again, creating this mixed reality environment uh, that was highly instrumented. And it was, you know, this is 10 years ago, 12 years ago, uh, ahead of a time, ahead of its time in many ways, uh, but uh, was kind of an example of the holodeck in the old West. So uh, to review, uh, I have talked about some of the characteristics of the holodeck, you know, in terms of sensory immersion and interactive narrative as key components uh, I've talked about how we've created virtual humans, both AI controlled and avatars, 
and then about the importance of high resolution dynamic visual content and how uh, you know ultimately we want to be able to import it into some sort of an engine and we've been using ride our rapid integration development environment is that uh, that holodeck engine uh but it it's basically means that we're using a game engine and but it enables us to use vr headsets or put it on large displays and allows multiple people to be in that environment uh, at once. And so uh, that is where we've come with the holodeck. And I wish I was there with you so that we could interact and ask, you know, we can have questions and, and talk after this seminar. But uh, I thank you very much for your attention. And I hope you have a great uh, workshop. So signing off here from Los Angeles, Randy Hill. Okay, uh, thanks for Professor Renda's great presentation. And if you have any question, please send to us and we will forward to Professor uh, Renda. And then I will introduce our next speaker. Okay, and uh, Professor Shi is currently the Director of Autocon Charitable Foundation Smart City Research Institute of Poly U. Director of Poly U Shenzhen Technology and Innovation Research Institute, Chair Professor in Geographic Science and Remote Sensing, and Director of Joint Research Laboratory on Spatial Information of Poly U and Wuhan University. And his research covers urban informatics for smart cities, geoinformatics science and remote sensing, artificial intelligence based object e extraction, and change detection from satellite imagery intelligent analytics and quality control for spatial big data and mobile mapping and 3D modeling based on LiDAR data and remote sensing imagery. He has won Natural, Natural Science Award, the China's highest award for fundamental research, distinguished the scholar prize by CPGIS and a gold medal in China in, in Invention Expo and the Smart 50 awards in uh, 2021, and Founders Award by International Spatial Accuracy Research Association, and the China's Science and Technology Progress Award in Surveying and Mapping, Wang Zizhou Award by International Society of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing, and the ESR Award for Best Scientific Paper in Geoinformatic Science by American Society of, of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing. And his presentation today is Building 3D Models by Mobile Mapping System. So let's welcome Professor Wen Zhongshi. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Very. Uh, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Data Hu, for the introduction. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, yes. Full, full screen, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the full screen. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your uh, invitation for this uh, talk for urban uh, workshop on urban scale point cloud understanding. Um, at the beginning, I yeah, I I was not quite sure how to <laughs> what kind of topic I'm gonna talk. But finally, I think maybe we'll talk about a three D um, uh, urban model uh, constructions. Uh, based on mobile mapping system, uh, which uh, is piece of work uh, by our team, and uh, hopefully um, that will uh, bring some uh, uh, useful information for the workshop. Okay, so that's the outline. I talk a little bit on urban informatics because that's work in the um, recent um, uh, five years or, or more, and then talk about the uh, scale matching. Map uh, method. Uh, this is a new method we developed for um, for the LiDAR data processing. And then we create uh, data sets. Uh, hopefully, I uh, can contribute to this community uh, in terms of LiDAR data processing. And then finally, our technologies we developed uh, Space Scan X and uh, uh, software uh, Space Matrix. So let me start with urban informatics. So um, uh, smart city is uh, a hot topic these days, but per perhaps you don't, uh, you, you are share with me that 
a smart city cannot be developed sustainably without a fundamental science and technology support, then what will be supporting science and technology? I call it as urban informatics. So uh, about six years ago, then I started to think on that, and then uh, so and then come with the fundamental theoretical framework for urban informatics, together with uh, our colleagues. So which include urban sensing. So LIDA is uh, one of data sources for urban sensing. But uh, before that, so we we have a photogrammetry. And we have a satellite image of uh, mobile mapping, indoor mapping, and so on and so forth. So that forms the data sources for uh, built uh, urban big data infrastructure. So um, then today, uh, the workshop mentioned about the um, 3D uh, urban models. So 3D urban models is part of that part as uh, so a spatial urban big data infrastructure. So after we have data, then we come with uh, urban computing, so virtual analytics, uh, uh, and uh, also the transformation modeling, uh, C modeling. So that's where the serious models can be used for urban compute computing. I think this is a step further for that workshop, because uh, workshop is build the 3D models. That's the target. But uh, perhaps we can go a step further. So after we have uh, the 3D model, so what? So now that we're based on those models, we do further computations, of course, needed to, together with other data sources. Then we come with uh, urban systems and uh, applications like transportation, urban mobility, energy, uh, resilience, and uh, urban crime security, and so on and so forth. So those are the urban application fields. Now, finally, we attract those uh, uh, urban applications and Towards the urban size, uh, that's the highest uh, uh, the vision we're gonna go, uh, like uh, urban cognitions, uh, spatial economy, and so on and so forth. So that is the whole picture of uh, urban informatics. So uh, after we form this outline, then uh, we work together and uh, with uh, a group, group forty groups actually, actually uh, from different universities and uh, involved 140 authors that uh, we work together and come with a book called Urban Informatics. Uh, so uh, perhaps you know, uh, this is a uh, Professor Michael, Be Michael Gucha. Uh, he's a father of uh, GI science. And uh, Professor Michael Betty, uh, he's a, a, a highly, the high uh, the citation for his work on urban planning uh, is the highest uh, worldwide. And we work uh, quite many colleagues from uh, MIT and uh, Cambridge, ETH, UCL, and so on and so forth. Then we come with a book. Uh, this is a big book, uh, 941 pages. Then uh, I'm very happy, uh, about a year and a half, uh, this book uh, reached to 1 million uh, chapter downloads. Uh, so this is uh, the one of the record of Springer. Uh, so that's, uh, they're very happy and announced that. And uh, uh, I'm very glad that book be highly recognized, uh, be used as a reference book, and also a textbook by many universities, uh, includes uh, MIT, um, Cambridge, uh, the uh, um, Zhejiang Universities, and Tongji Universities. So, uh, well, okay, today uh, I, I, I share with my uh, talk, and I, uh, I, I have no souvenirs to you uh, here, that book. Uh, you can free download as a souvenir from me. Uh, here is the barcode, uh, uh, QR code. You, you, you can just scan this and you download this for free. Uh, hopefully this book, uh, can be useful for your work, um, in, um, in, in, the, in the area related to the urban informatics. Then we also come with a journal. Then, uh, we, with the same topic called the urban informatics. So this is the open access journal. And currently, our society um, sponsored the, char uh, the, the open access fee, so you don't have to pay for that. And then you can submit paper to that journal and publish it for free, um, uh, perhaps at one first one or two years. Then we form an international society on urban informatics with the commissions on urban informatics science, urban informatics system and applications, urban sensing and positioning, and urban big data infrastructure 
and uh, urban analytics and computing. Uh, so that's uh, a community. If you think uh, you uh, you somehow relate to that views, uh, you are welcome to join that uh, community. Uh, it's called a, uh, you just uh, um, by scan that uh, code, then you can get access to um, to the community. So actually, we also offer web webinars. So for example, we have one series of webinars on uh, urban informatics related. Uh, in one of our webinar, I think that's organized in March seven seventh. Uh, we had one, so uh, we that's where the speakers uh, uh, in the um, for that seminar uh, webinar, and we're glad uh, it's about uh, one hundred seventy five thousand audience uh, watch to that uh, um, uh, the uh, webinar just in that a few hours. So, uh, so I think uh, that's um, uh, indicate uh, the popularity of that talk. Uh, perhaps that's related to the smart city, and uh, perhaps also the uh, that is very very in interesting and important field for future. Um, so people come to pay more attention uh, to that area. Then for education, so we also uh, have a PhD degree, master degree, and a bachelor degree. And uh, I have to share with you uh, for MSc in Urban Informatics and Smart City, that's become a very popular academic also. For example, uh, that program uh, became to one of the most important uh, uh, po uh, program uh, for the whole university, uh, indicated by the uh, the uh, how many people uh, are, are bidding for one position uh, for such kind of a uh, MSc degree. Uh, so uh, that's very, very high and popular. So through academic program, uh, webinar, society, journal, book, and so on and so forth, uh, we were working on that urban informatics. So uh, this is uh, uh, come uh, as uh, the um, foundation science and technology uh, for a smart city. Uh, because today we talk about the uh, urban three. 3D modeling. Uh, let me share with you uh, the smart city platform. This is a platform developed by our team. Then as, uh, we handle multi-resource, multi-source spatial data and multi-scale data, include 2D, 2.5D, and 3D models, mesh model, or 3D LiDAR data, point cloud, uh, uh, internet of things, IoT data, and uh, dual social media data, uh, dual record find a satellite image, uh, digital terrain model and uh, basic map. Mm -hmm. So those are the data we handled by the um, the um, um, spatial uh, smart city platform. And then for that data uh, storage, management, visualization, and uh, also analytics. So that's data uh, being uh, analysis of city GMM uh, standards and uh, also the uh, model the uh, the platform, you can see the details. And that data will be for further data exchange with BIM model, building information modeling. So with different floors and layers. So this is the, our campus, uh, we build the 3D models for that. So that's uh, uh, general introduce of uh, our development in the urban informatics um, and uh, smart city. Let me go a little more details on the what we had done uh, related to the point cloud processing. Uh, one of the methods uh, is in line with the registration mapping segmentation uh, based on mobile laser scanning technology or mobile mapping system. So um, scanning, uh, uh, scan registration, mapping, and the thematic segmentation are uh, three uh, consecutive and closely related to the procedures in building and understanding the digital science using mobile LIDAR data. So uh, that's the way the work belongs uh, of ours is belongs to uh, that fields. Actually, that's a, a very basic research for land surveying, robotics, and computer vision. So scan, this is a scan um, with uh, 300, um, it doesn't work. Okay, so this is a scan. Uh, they in uh, blue and another scan in uh, uh, red. So this is the two scans with laser scanner. 
So what we need to do is do the scan registration. So we after registration, uh, these two scans merge in one unique coordinate system. So for mapping is to st stitch all those scans. Uh, so for example, we have a scanner, we bring and move together, move forwards. Then we have a scan one, two, three, maybe a few thousands. Then we need to stitch those scans together and form that's a 3D model. So that's so how from single scan to stitch to the point cloud model. And after that, that we will have 3D models, we need to conduct semantic segmentation. And those are the segmentations. Then this is wall, roof, floor, and windows. So those are the segmentation result, for example. Now, one of the methods that we do the uh, matching is called a rect match. This is one method uh, developed by our team. Uh, I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, Dr. Peng Xing Chen, uh, one of my PhD students, and together with other members in our group. group then we form this is a map a rec match, rec match uh, method. This is a scan match method. Uh, use the rectangle flatten representation. Uh, this is the whole idea. It's uh, the objective of this method is for scan matching uh, by using this uh, proposed uh, rectangle uh, flatting representation. So the research question here is uh, how to enhance the reliability of the scan matching in multiple scenarios. So that's uh, our problem. So what we uh, did is a, a translation of a residual function and a greedy rectangle extraction method proposed in that uh, research. So uh, here we have a targeting scan and source scan. Then we conduct uh, the down sampling, clustering, point to rectangle uh, distance measure, and that's Newton Gaussian, uh, Newton optimization, and finally, uh, rigid transformation and uh, realized that scan metric. Uh, come to the details. Uh, here's a translation of well, residual function. Uh, let's uh, compare the uh, the uh, traditional measure, uh, a point to point or a plan to plan uh, alignment. Then we need to match. Uh, this is a source uh, point of the patch. That's reference point of the uh, patch. So what we need to do is need to match uh, the corresponding point from that two source and reference patch and to do that. By alignment, actually by the traditional method, we only can match those overlap area. If you study photogrammetry, that's this method that looks like the overlap areas. Uh, but in our method, uh, this is the uh, source point of match and this is the reference point of matching. So we not only uh, match those areas perpendicular to that area and in the overlap, uh, this overlap area, but we also uh, match those points which is not a perpendicular to that area. So in that case, we will have more points being uh, matched. And so the method is more reliable. So uh, then, uh, another uh, point, the important one is a uh, uh, rectangle extraction method. We uh, develop a greedy uh, method. So CDDF method, this is a cluster based on density, direction, and uh, flattening. So uh, this is a base uh, traditional cluster mesh, DB scan, and this is ours. So uh, our method here, then we use plan first, line second, let's flat the structure last. Let me share some examples here. So for example, uh, here's the two uh, on a straight scan. Then we have those uh, um, rectangles and we also have some linear features. And we also have some scans which is not well defined as a plan error. So actually we use all those possible sources uh, in our matching. Uh, so it's called a grand rectangle extraction method. Uh, this is the, how the method we formulate mathematically. Uh, let me share with you a result. Uh, so here is the um, overall um, successful rate. The proposed method 
can reach uh, some 90%, uh, 93 or 95%. So uh, relatively better result in the uh, in compared with existing ones. So here are the features of the newly proposed uh, rack match method. Uh, is the, one is the rectangle flattening representation method. One is a CZDF a cluster method. Um, so this is the, um, the new um, method being proposed. So we divide the points into uh, different dimensions and uh, how to match those errors in the reference ones. Um, next, uh, I would like to share with you the PolyU uh, BP uh, Coma datasets. Uh, this is one of the datasets uh, we developed and contributed to this community uh, for those researchers or scholars who may need to develop and compare uh, their method developed for mobile mapping methods uh, using different data source. Uh, we developed that data source additional to ISPIS data sets as an additional uh, data sources you may use. So this data source is uh, data sources uh, called the PolyU BP Coma data sets. A data sets and a benchmark towards mobile colorized mapping using a benchmark uh, backpack uh, multi sensor system. Uh, like here in our system, we have a uh, uh, cameras as uh, laid back, uh, GPS or GNSS, IMU, LIDAR, computer, and other uh, uh, equipment inside. So that's uh, uh, multiple uh, sensors integration. So this data sets, uh, we, we have a data set and uh, that's a uh, um, uh, benchmark. Uh, first of all, we we collect the reference data or ground truth data. Uh, we use a high accuracy of uh, uh, laser scanner, which to uh, to millimeter uh, level. And we also use a colorized point color uh, data with a, a, a millimeter level accuracy. So that is the, the color checker. So we have a standard colors. So the reason we use that is we both need to compare geometry and also the color uh, in color space in how, how to check uh, the accuracy of uh, your data or our methods. So this is benchmark uh, pipeline. So first of all, this is uh, the, uh, our building, um, this uh, block Z of uh, Hong Kong Polytechnic University. So that's this mapping environment here. Then our first NAS, uh, this is a, a reference data collection. Then we use this, uh, um, the um, uh, 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 high position uh, uh, LIDAR um, scanner. So then we have as a, a terrestrial LIDAR scanner point cloud. So we have this. Then we generate uh, a resident point cloud. Then we have two features, geometric errors and uh, uh, colorization errors. So then that's for comparison. Next. Uh, here we take our uh, system, uh, mobile mapping system, as an example, to compare the result from our um, equipment. Uh, this is registered color and the uh, colorized point cloud, and then we compare that result with the reference data. So then we can uh, understand the accuracy level of our um, equipment and also the data sources collect from our uh, system. So uh, in the future, uh, one researcher, if uh, he or she needed to test his, uh, his or her proposed master, and uh, he or she just needed to use his own equipment to collect those uh, uh, registered point cloud and the colorized point cloud and the compare this reference one, then you understand what's the accuracy of your algorithm. Or your system. So, for example, here's indoor environment. Um, this is our smart city lab. Um, we we do the collection. This is a use a higher accuracy terrestrial laser scanner. Then we have that point cloud. Here's the point cloud collect based on our system. Then we compare. We can compare um, the the target point cloud uh, based on our mobile mapping system with the terrestrial lidar scanner. 
by comparing the two, then we understand what's the accuracy level of our system. Of course, we also provide outdoor environment data sets. So this is the garden of the uh, the floor of our uh, uh, building. And then uh, we have this geometry of those uh, outside part and also um, uh, the uh, color marks here uh, for comparison, like bar color part. So um, so this is the, based on the uh, both indoor and outdoor data sets. Then we set a different uh, uh, target points. Then we do the comparison. So the geometric error uh, for our system here is about a seven centimeter level. And the colorist error is 0.14. Um, so uh, let me highlight the uh, work uh, for this part. Uh, so basically, um, uh, uh, two laser scanners can ensure the full uh, FOV. That's our laser scanner system. And acceleration, angle, speed, orientation are measured uh, by this uh, system. That's uh, based on uh, our laser scanner system uh, here. That's our mobile mapping system. So that's addressed to, to the laser point and also uh, from this, uh, the, the LIDAR point from those laser scanner. So uh, here, let me continue. So with the FOV, so we can see the 360 degree uh, views and those parameters with uh, 400 hertz we can uh, get. And the RTK uh, data is provided, means we can get a satellite uh, coordinate that's being transformed to laser scan data. So you can have an absolute coordinate of each of the laser point X, Y, Z, and that's one. And data sets uh, uh, collections of uh, 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 parametric image, uh, that's our solution uh, captured. And 91 stations of a terrestrial point cloud as for reference are provided. So that's just a quite a lot of data sets. Then you can base on those data sets to uh, compare uh, what uh, you're gonna test, either your system or your method. Um, so this is uh, the data sets uh, we provide is uh, uh, with uh, pos uh, positional um, mobile mapping colorized data. So you can both uh, compare the geometry accuracy and also the position of a color. Um, those are the data sets so quite a big, 800 gigabyte uh, being provided. And also with uh, GISs, I'm mean, from data sets from the backpack mobile mapping system. So an uh, opportunity to benchmark mapping and a colorized uh, colorization accuracy simultaneously for a mapping uh, a system or method or multi sensor system. If you're working on this area, uh, you can use NAS data sets as a reference and to evaluate yourself, uh, develop the method or system. Then we provide a developer kit using the data sets and the baseline result for performance comparison. So you can compare NAS results. So uh, by this, I, I think uh, we hope uh, we can co contribute to NASA community by this additional, more detailed uh, data sets. Uh, as I I understand, uh, compare existing data sets. Uh, this is uh, perhaps the richest uh, data sets uh, we ever available publicly. I think uh, perhaps you can um, use if you need. Uh, Next, uh, let me uh, share with you the system, uh, our system, mobile mapping system called a Space Scan X. Uh, so this is a system, uh, both with light version, so it's a relative light with a, a light camera, or that's a professional camera to do this. So by using this, you just carry this backpack, then I walk in a three-dimensional environment, like here, uh, you can see here the person carrying that uh, system, just moving the, around our campus. So you can three dimensional um, 
three-dimensional uh, buildings and structures being captured by scan by point cloud. So that's uh, the structure. That's the structure here. And neighbor here is the building as the higher the, the highest building in the campus. And after that scan, then we develop technology to build that 3D models uh, based on point cloud and also the videos of photos captured by this system and form this data. So that's a three-dimensional uh, city model. Uh, here in detail, uh, the detailed part is our campus, the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. So the rest part are the buildings of Hong Kong, you can see here. So uh, that's where the technology we developed, uh, we call the mobile mapping system on backpack. So we did a test uh, for a larger area and the accuracy is uh, um, horizontal is five centimeter, 5.7, and a vertical is 2.5 centimeter. So based on that, uh, this is a very hilly area, it's a slope uh, that's about 200 meters long. And then I will check the quality of the system. So it's a centimeter levels in that area. So you can get the uh, absolute coordinates of uh, in that accuracy in real time. Space metrics. Uh, after you have uh, this um, uh, saw hot, uh, hardware, you need to have a corresponding data processing functions. So the function software here called a space metrics. So uh, we we needed to to have a basic functions like geo reference segmentation and registration, and we needed to have a model building or construction to build the walls, uh, small structures, and those door window pillars uh, for build BIM. And the general image views uh, we have this texture mapping to match uh, to map those uh, textures on three D model. And we also have this model merge for high-rise buildings. Uh, we use UAV to uh, build the model, the top part. And for bottom part details, uh, we use uh, uh, backpack mobile mapping system, the space scans. Let me share an example with you. Here's one building. Um, we needed to have a photorealistic 3D building for that. So all the images are must be geometrically correct, and also real. That's are the four real applications, and uh, um, users really need that real one. So that's where captured by UAV. That's the part being captured by mobile mapping system. Then we stitch them together and form as uh, um, from that's the 3D model. Uh, so those uh, the windows, the facades, you will see this um, facilities here, uh, they are all um, true image. And then uh, for metaverse, uh, you really need to have uh, uh, simulations of people uh, in that uh, very three-dimensional environment. Um, you can go to uh, inside uh, later on based on the inside model before we build and also vehicles and the people walking in that area. So that's where the, I think the 3D smart city model perhaps you need to build uh, if you work on the area of a smart city and uh, uh, talk about the 3D urban model of that workshop. Uh, that's our examples from us and to develop based on our equipment, uh, space scan X and also corresponding software space metrics. Uh, those are real uh, uh, shape and the image of the facilities there, and also that's uh, uh, drainage uh, uh, cables and uh, uh, systems here. You can see that's real. One. I stop here. So those are the three D models, three uh, D geometry part model, uh, based on the mobile mapping system backpack. And after that, we needed to form 3D models, like that's called a street view, and also that's 330 degree views of the um, indoor, outdoor, um, the, uh, the narrow corridors, 
and uh, that's the slope areas and so on. So those are the 3D models uh, uh, built uh, based on data captured of our the mobile mapping system. And we also built the photorealistic 3D model, as I show you the building before. And even those details of the uh, paintings or sculptures uh, in that old street that have been captured as 3D model being built. So this technology uh, can be used widely uh, in smart city applications in the future. Uh, for example, like a forest mapping. Um, for building the beam models and both indoor and outdoor and use the 3D city model and for uh, highways or high definition map that's for autonomous driving uh, for detection of objects on a road and build a road and for slope management that's a 200 meters long slope uh, being scanned uh, as a slope. Um, yeah, with that, I conclude my presentation. Uh, and I wish you a very successful uh, workshop. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shi. Yes, thank you. thank you for your great presentation. And uh, I have noticed that, that there are some uh, some questions from our live broadcasting. So do you mind to answer some of the questions? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So let me choose. Okay, the first one is, so uh, you have done so much uh, amazing works. And uh, what do you think the, the main challenge in urban informatics now? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, I, I think, yes. Um, number one is we need to use this uh, size and the technology to address uh, the urban problems in the real world. Uh, for example, uh, we have tra traffic congestion, we have uh, environmental pollution, uh, we have uh, um, urban disaster, and today uh, public uh, um, uh, health issues, uh, COVID-19. So uh, we need to use our uh, technology to develop solutions for that. So for example, for COVID-19, uh, we develop method to predict uh, the risk of each uh, uh, the district in Hong Kong, we divided the whole city into 291 small areas. Then we predict uh, each that small area, what will be the risk, uh, we call the onset risk of COVID in the next three days. Uh, if you're interested in that, just go to the website of our Smart City Research Institute, you will see that's real one. Uh, so I think that's very important that we develop that technology, uh, we need to use technology to solve the real problems. So I think that's the challenge uh, I have to us. Thank you. Yeah, 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 that's great. Your your group and your team has done very great applications. And also, uh, there is a, a, a question related to the space metrics system. Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, we use the UAV photogrammetry or, or other kind of techniques to to reconstruct the uh, 3D point clouds. And we usually find that there are many holes and uh, incomplete parts. So how the space metrics can reconstruct such photorealistic and and very smooth uh, 3D things? That, that mm. looks very fantastic. <laughs> yes, uh, I, I understand this problem uh, because uh, uh, Photograms method to use uh, those uh, based on photos and uh, to um, to build a 3D models uh, for those areas. Either with the overlap is not enough or image quality is not enough, then you will see the holes there. And uh, so so that's the beauty to integrate a different technology and the light based solution being integrated photogrammetry. Then that that might be one of the potential solution to that problems. Um, yes, indeed, that's uh, the one of the uh, current big problem for uh, photogrammetry based uh, 3D modeling. Uh, I, I, yes. Yeah, so for in this question, I, I just wondering how long do you reconstruct, for example, the, 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 the building demo, the, how long it takes to reconstruct okay. such a complex thing? Uh, for geometric part, uh, it's, uh, it's very quick, uh, it's very fast. 
uh, but uh, the for build the um uh, the geometry build the facade with image uh, being together go together with the uh, 3D model uh, that just takes time uh, we uh, we have a uh, uh, some uh, part of uh, using automatic solutions it works uh, but it doesn't work for all the problems for those difficult part uh, we also use the interactive uh, uh, supporting tools to supporting work manually or semi automatically to do that. So that takes time. A um, few days, yes, you need that. Uh, especially if you like to get to high quality uh, 3D model, like I, I showed you before, I, indeed it takes time. Yeah. yeah, actually, the demo looks really fantastic. Yeah, it's really photorealistic and uh, Almost like a real scenery, yeah. And uh, oh, okay, there are also some questions. So, so uh, the first one is um, uh, how the rapid development of deep learning will affect will affect the urban informatics or urban computing. Because recently we 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 have witnessed a lot of deep learning techniques. Does this will have a, a positive impact to the urban informatics? Yes, indeed. Uh, let me share with you one example with uh, our work. Uh, we use either satellite image or use the air photos to detect landslides. Uh, this is one very typical uh, urban disaster in city area uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, we have about uh, 300 small landslides each year in Hong Kong. So our method is we develop a deep learning method for detect uh, the landslides. Uh, so this is area object detection from images. So based on our solution that we, uh, we developed as to, uh, the system and uh, the, the Hong Kong government and also international consulting companies are using our technology for their daily operation. So with our system, uh, in the, the, the efficiency be improved for eight times, for example, for search, search kind of work, a team with eight person. Uh, a few months to do the work uh, for a city. Now just one person plus our system, now it works. So this is one example. Uh, we uh, use AI technology to improve our working efficiency and uh, to the real world applications. Of course, uh, uh, we have to also think uh, quality. Uh, the, the accuracy of our system reached to 90%. Uh, this is higher than manual method. And also the details, uh, we can describe the whole area of landslides instead of uh, in the past, people just say landslide from here and uh, down to here, one line. So we'll provide more detailed information, higher accuracy and a high efficiency with AI method deep learning. So I think that's in the future, I do see the opportunities or potential of AI technology being uh, contributed to the uh, smart city uh, applications. Uh, that's are the uh, uh, very important directions I need to study. Thank you. So thank you, thank you very much. And uh, okay, I will choose the, 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 the last question. Uh, and that is from, I, I think some, some younger or junior researchers. And, and the question is, as, uh, as an distinguished expert in this field, would you please give uh, like the junior researchers some advices uh, on how to quickly and systematically uh, enter this field? Because uh, here nowadays there are a lot of materials and the information and some of the from the planning field, uh, from the computation field, and also the urban informatics field. So can you give some advices? Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, first of all, let me take uh, urban informatics as, as example. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, um, number one is this is an interdiscipline area, uh, involve urban size, um, computer size, and uh, geomatics. Geomatics means uh, uh, either um, uh, GIS or remote sensing or uh, the GPS uh, uh, technology. We will call that geomatics. So, so you can see by urban informatics, this is an interdisciplinary area. Uh, so you, um, you needed to learn many different, uh, knowledge from different area. 
Uh, so first of all, I, I think you needed to identify one of the research focus of you uh, you are interested in, or you think potentially uh, that would be useful for, for the future. Uh, my view on that is uh, trying to identify real problems from a, a real world, uh, not artificial one. Uh, nobody knows <laughs> you, what you, you are talking and that you are you're really use, uh, whether it's useful or not. Trying to identify the way useful and real problem and uh, from real world, starting from there, and then identify the research questions and and whether it's worthwhile to, to do the research and to study uh, fundamentally. So the best uh, PhD dissertation, from my view, is necessarily coming from real world, real problem. And then you can work on that, come with the innovation scientifically. So both with uh, real value and also scientific innovation. You put those two together, that's the best uh, research dissertation. Uh, this is the uh, uh, second thing I would uh, say how to choose. I, I, I just think that's a, a junior scholar, maybe a PhD student or something, that, or even junior colleagues are in, encouraged to do that. I try to think on from a, um, a real world. And, uh, but you cannot just simply solve those real problems. The problem that you solved need to really have a scientific value. Uh, then identifying the, the research question from a, um, a inter, inter or we call a transdiscipline area uh, here from computer science, urban science, and genetics. Uh, number three, uh, research should be um, something you interest in first. Number two, uh, you're good at for somehow. Okay, don't choose something I think is too hard to you and uh, you are not interested in. Uh, perhaps in that case, you cannot do good work. Uh, so that's are the three points I would suggest hopefully can be helpful for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's uh, really very, very useful and helpful for junior students that he, they, uh, they're solving the real and the useful problems. I always think that he is very important, especially for PhD, PhD students. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you for for your great talk and uh, support. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for your invitation. Wish you a very successful workshop. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you bye very bye. much. Bye bye. bye, -bye. And then I will introduce our third uh, keynote speakers and the Professor Tiraj. And he's a professor at the University of Tübingen and the Department of Computer Science. And his work received several awards, such as the Emmy Nobel Grant, German Patent Recognition Award, and the Best People and Nominations, SAPR 21, CPR 2020, and 3DV 2022, 3DV uh, 18. Euro graphics and the BMWC 2013. Okay, let's uh, welcome Professor Giraud. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. I'm Gerard Ponsmoy, and I'm a professor at the University of Tübingen, where I lead a group which focuses on computer vision, graphics, and learning. Today, I want to talk about how to capture and model human behavior. And hopefully you will see that this has many connections to the challenges of this workshop because most of our work focuses or consists in extracting compact models and information out of raw point cloud data. While we work on general objects and scenes as well, we place particularly emphasis on humans. So why that's the case? Well, since the beginning of civilization, we spend our lives interacting and perceiving other humans, and that's the society we live in, where humans play a central role. The human body and human interaction has been depicted multiple times throughout art and history. And now, one of the, go the ultimate goals of AI is to reproduce natural human behavior that means building agents that can navigate, understand, and interact with the 3D world. This 3D world might be um, like a physical world in the case of robots, 
or it might be a virtual world in the case of virtual agents. Here I'm showing you a short clip of our CVPR21 paper, which, which we called Human Positioning System, where we capture for the first time humans interacting in large 3D scenes in the world. And um, it would be really great to be, build agents that can um, navigate these 3D worlds autonomously, because this would bring us one step closer to real human behavior. So, of course, one question is, how do we start building such models of humans and models of the world? So, much of our work um, fits within this um, scheme here where we have a closed loop, where we have data and observations that we want to capture. We want to link them to a built model of the 3D world, including humans and, and other objects. And this model of the three worlds should be controllable, should be understandable, something we can manipulate. And, um, and then basically there's a synthesis process in which we compare this model of the three D world with the original 3D um, data observations. So the key questions are, how do we represent this 3D world? How do we feed these world models to data? And how do we learn 3D world models from noisy and partial observations? Let me adjust this one second. Yeah. So in terms of research topics in my group, we they can be roughly divided into models of human appearance, this modeling how we look. More recently, we're becoming more and more interested in, in, in human behavior. This is modeling and capturing how we interact with objects and the 3D world. And we also work on general shape and scene representation learning. And the focus of this work will be on these last two. And, um, but, but most of the talk will be focused on how to model human behavior. But since this is very relevant to this workshop, let me start with a work that we'll present at ECCB um, next week, um, which is basically on how to obtain 3D instant segmentation with weak annotations. This is what we call like uh, box to mask. And um, the first author is Julian Cibane, and he will present it um, at ECCB um, next week. So the goal here is to do three instant segmentation. This means for every 3D point in the scene, we want to know not only the category, whether this is a chair or a sofa, but we also want to distinguish different instances. If we have two sofas, we want to assign a label for sofa number one and a different label for sofa number two. This distinguishing instances makes the problem much harder because first of all, there's no consistent way of annotating the data. Like you cannot assign simply numbers to sofa number one and two and three because you don't know the number of instances in the scene. And also this would be completely arbitrary. And also, obtaining dense annotations is very costly. So if we consider like the type of annotation, if we start with training data that is densely annotated, then we can obtain accurate results, but this is very um, labor intensive to annotate these data sets. And therefore, there's very few data sets that actually contain these labels. What some people have been investigating is whether we can use weaker labels, for example, like sparse key points indicating the instance, which lead to less accurate results. But of course, these are much cheaper to annotate, much quicker. And, um, and therefore, like there's very few data sets that, um, that, um, that could, uh, but however, there's very few data sets that have this type of annotation. And a widespread, widespread uh, type of annotation is the bounding box. And um, what we show in this work is that you can leverage the bounding box annotation to obtain dense semantic segmentation and dense instance se uh, segmentation from bounding box alone. So we have like um, the best of both worlds. Basically, we have like um, we obtain accurate results. The annotations are cheap because bounding boxes are much cheaper to annotate than dense annotations. And many, annota many data sets are already labeled with bounding boxes, which makes this um, very attractive. 
So to reiterate, the goal here is to go from bounding boxes, training from bounding boxes alone, and then at test time, being able to take a scene and parse it into dense instance segmentation. So what's the key idea that enables that? Previously, what um, many methods do is like take a 3D point in the scene, and this 3D point votes for an instance. And the instance is represented with the center. Then basically you take all these votes and then you do clustering in order to figure out um, the different instances in the scene. Instead, what we do is we don't vote in, in, um, in the instance center, but we vote in the full bounding box parameter space. And this change that seems like trivial, like allows us to get much better results and more importantly, allows us to train um, with bounding box annotations alone. So the trick here is to take every point, every point casts a vote in bounding box parameter space, then we design a clustering algorithm that takes into account the bounding box parameters and allows us to backtrack. This means that to know uh, for all the votes, um, like to know, like uh, assign, right, um, a cluster center to each of these um, points in the scene that voted for a particular bounding box. So you might ask, well, isn't that trivial? Because I can take the bounding boxes and label every single point um, inside the bounding box as the instance. Well, that would work if you have isolated and very well separated objects, but many times you have bounding boxes that overlap with multiple objects, as I'm showing you here. For example, this chair overlaps, this bounding box overlaps with the chair, and it also overlaps with the table. And it's very difficult to disambiguate this. So with box to mask, we provide a solution that using only the bounding boxes allows us to get this um, instance segmentations. So here's the key inside of our work. So what we show here is um, on the top, the center voting scheme, which has been used multiple times. So essentially here we show a heat map, right? That shows for every um, point, a coloring, the brighter, it means the lower the distance. Um, it shows us the distance in center, um, in cluster center space. So what you would like to see here is a very fast decay from the instance. In this case, we're considering this um, chair over here. We would like that every point that doesn't belong to the chair, like we would like that this would be basically a very dim color like this one, right? So that, that this would decay very quickly so that it would make clustering much easier. However, that's not the case. And this is because we're using a metric that is not discriminative enough for um, the different instances. And basically when we do like clustering and we backtrack um, the, the votes, essentially we cannot recover an accurate instance. And instead, if you replace this representation of centers by the full bounding box, which is a very simple change, um, like you get a much more discriminative uh, descriptor because here we're showing, for example, like here we're showing this, um, the same heat map as before, but now the dis distance metric is not the, the distance in centers, but the distance metric is basically the distance in bounding box parameter space. And so now two different bounding boxes will be, will have a very um, low distance because like this has more information about the different instances. So this makes the decay fall off much quicker and it allows to basically backtrack with a clustering algorithm much better. So this is a bit confusing, like I please, I, I refer to the paper, um, but hopefully like you get a little bit like the, the, the key idea. So the nice thing of this is that then you can take data sets where you have only bounding box annotations, like for example, the ARCID scenes, there's no dense annotations and you can train with these um, weak labels in order to obtain dense labels. So it has been trained only in bounding boxes and at test time, we can obtain a semantic segmentation and also a segmentation of instances. So the results are fairly accurate. Um, they are close to training with dense annotations. And um, 
Yeah, and oftentimes are very close to the ground truth. Yeah, so if you have more questions about this work, I suggest that you reach out to us and then talk to us during the conference. And um, yeah, we, we're happy to discuss more about this. Okay, so in this second part of the talk, um, I want to switch gears and talk about our work on capturing and modeling human behavior. Now, this topic is perhaps a little bit further away from the topics of the uh, of the workshop. This is like urban point cloud processing, but hopefully you can pick up some ideas that are also useful uh, for that domain. So, I want to start by describing a paper that we presented last year at CPPR, which is called Behave, which is both a data set and a method for tracking human object interactions. So when modeling and capturing human behavior, um, the same as when you capture and model like human appearance, the first step is to be able to capture data. And by capture data, I mean not only recording point clouds of people or images or videos, but turning this information into a format that is understandable and that you can then like um, learn further from it. So first of all, you have to think about which hardware you're gonna use to capture humans. So one option is to use marker-based motion capture, which is the traditional method um, of placing markers on the body. And then you have like, cameras that records, record these optical markers, and then essentially then you can triangulate and then you can recover the human motion and, and also the human shape. And this is like providing very high quality data, but it's very expensive. Uh, you can only record data in a limited recording volume, and it's not very easy to scale to different recording locations, which is very limiting when you want to capture real human natural interaction with the 3D world. Now, the other option is to go with an IMU-based method. Um, we've used this in the past and we're using this. Uh, sometimes it's very useful because they are easy to scale, they are cheaper, and um, essentially it's not restricted to a, a confined recording volume like, like the traditional marker-based systems, but it's not very accurate for close-range interactions. For example, like for human-object interaction, which is making it, perhaps alone not the best solution. So we propose an easy to use portable multi-camera recording setup. And with this, we recorded the, the Behave data set. So what is the setup? So basically we use four calibrated Kinects and this data set features five males and three females. It's recorded at three different locations. And basically we recorded people performing daily interactions with a variety of objects, including boxes, chairs, tables, backpacks, monitors, and so on. And um, it's perhaps surprising that when we started working on this, we didn't find any other 3D data set featuring the, the mesh of the three human and the mesh of the object. And the main reason is that this is actually very difficult to, um, to record this data and to be able to capture such interactions. So I'm going to explain next how we um, solve this challenge, or at least partially solve. So essentially, this is the data that we are dealing with. Um, we have like a human interacting with a box, and we want to obtain as output like the a 3D mesh of the human and a 3D mesh of the of the of the object. For the human, we use um, the simple body model. For those of you who are not in this um, field, this is the most popular body model that is widely used in, in academia and industry. And essentially, like it parameterizes the space of body shapes with pose and shape, and um, it produces a mesh um, as output of these parameters. And it's convenient because every mesh produced by this model is, um, is um, guaranteed to be in the space of, of human shapes. So. Um, Exactly. So we also have um, interactions like, for example, interacting with backpacks and um, like we also provide with the data set, like the contact points um, where the human interacts with the object and so on and so forth. So 
to get things started, um, we had to do like hard work. And this means like um, labeling um, some of the frames and then developing an optimization method to, um, to be able to lift from the point clouds or the images to um, this mesh of the human and the object. And for this, we needed to use like several um, like tools that are available that, that enable doing this um, like, for example, like open pose and Detectron to detect um, um, like the um, like the human silhouette and and, and also the, the the object. And basically, we had to annotate some key points on the object so that we can uh, uh, recover the object pose more accurately, because otherwise, it's quite ambiguous. Now, this is scientifically perhaps not the most interesting um, part of the project, but this is something that you need to get some data, right? And then once you have some data of um, the observations, in this case, the point clouds, and paired with the meshes that of the human and the object, then you can train a method to do this automatically. And this is what I'm going to describe next, which is um, the more interesting part. So if we look at the classical way of fitting models to data, essentially, um, what you do is you minimize an objective function with respect to the model parameters. Here, the model parameters are uh, the parameters of the human and the object. And basically, you minimize some distance um, in feature space, perhaps, um, of features extracted from the observation, in this case, this point cloud, and features extracted from your world representation, uh, in this case, the mesh of the human and the mesh of the object. And then basically, you optimize this, and then um, hopefully, you converge to good local minima. However, this is um, difficult to optimize um, because there's many possible solutions, there's many local minima, and um, there's many ambiguities when matching which points in the source uh, point cloud match with which points on the target um, model or, or vice versa, better said. So basically, the idea here is that we will use neural fields to make the optimization well behaved. And I'm going to explain next what I mean by neural fields. So in behave, basically, we start with a point cloud of the human and the object, and we don't know um, how this relates to this um, parametric mesh models of the human and the object. And so basically, we predict for every point in space a correspondence to the human model. And um, and then essentially, like we also predict, like the um, the object shape um, in a way that we can then fit the model to these neural reconstructions um, jointly, so that we can align like the human and the object to the point cloud, obtaining like this also like the contacts. So let me explain this a little bit more in detail. So. We predict for the human mesh, uh, for, no, for the human body, we predict the, what we call the human distance field, which is essentially a distance field, which is, takes the value zero um, at the surface points. And then like um, for every point outside the surface, we store or we predict the distance to the surface. This is a classical unsigned distance field prediction, which is directly predicted um, given a point in space and the point cloud encoding um, we predict directly this um, distance field. We predict exactly the same for the object, so an object distance field, um, which we denote as UJO. And then we also predict the correspondence field to the reference body model. So for every point in space, we store which is the closest body model, model point in this canonical template. This is essentially segmenting the space according to the body parts of the body in a continuous manner. So given these fields, we can optimize like this template here um, to fit each of these um, fields jointly. So we can optimize both the human mesh model and the object together. So a little bit more in detail, like the first term here. So when we fit, we, we use a classical method, but we use the neural fields to make the optimization robust and um, reliable. So the first term is basically saying that we want that for a given point PI, where we're looking at, right, we do this uh, for many points, 
it could be inside or outside the surface. We wanted the distance from the point to the surface of the mesh. This is M. The mesh is the human mesh is M. Um, like the surface evaluated at the corresponding location predicted by the neural field as well, should match the neural distance field for the human mesh. So this is saying that the neural distance reconstruction should match the distance from the point to the surface, so to make things um, consistent. And for the object, we have something similar. What do we want? We want that the template of the object aligns with a zero um, level set of the distance field. So then, then what we, we know is that we need to minimize the sum of distances, uh, this UGO evaluated at the template object vertices, VJ. And we also have like a more classical chamfer distance um, to um, match the object template mesh to the, to the point cloud in the input. So then we also have a term um, for the contact. So essentially we say there's going to be a contact for all points that um, are close to the object and close to the mesh. And close, we define here with a threshold of two centimeters. So for every point that is below two centimeters to both the human mesh and the object, we consider this to be a contact point. And then we force that this vertex in the human mesh, sorry, the vertex in the in the object mesh matches the um, vertex in the human mesh. And um, very quickly, without explaining details, this is exactly what we do. We um, uh, we, we predict the neural fields and then we feed the human mesh and um, and the object mesh to these neural fields, and we can reconstruct um, like the interactions as you can see here. This is using like four Kinect cameras, but still um, the problem is challenging because there's many self occlusions and like the person interacts with the object and it's very difficult to um, to keep track of both the human and the object um, at all times. So we also track, um, yeah, we have a wide variety, variety of uh, human object interactions and this data set is um, is available for for research purposes. So, if you're interested in this, like, please um, check our website, and you can download it. And if you run into problems, like, please contact us, and we will try to um, to address them. Okay, but this behave is using four Kinect cameras, which was um, sometimes possible, but many times we're interested in the um, single image reconstruction, and this is what we will present at ECCV in this conference. And this is the method called Core. And essentially here we want to, given an image, we want to reconstruct the human mesh and the object. And importantly, we want to understand the relationship between uh, the object and the human. So now this is a much harder problem because you have a single image and then you don't have depth. So you have uh, depth ambiguity and you don't know how far exactly the person is from the object. And this is sometimes very um, ambiguous. And you have heavy occlusion. Sometimes the human completely occludes the object. So it is clear that you need to use strong priors in order to overcome these um, challenges. So here, what we do is like we train, like an encode using data from the behave data set. Uh, we train a model that um, parses the image into a feature grid that um, predicts then like, um, oops, sorry, uh, ignore. Sorry about that. Um, so predicts the human mesh model and the parts and uh, predicts like also like a neural distance field for the object and also predicts an initialization for, um, for the object such that again, we can do joint optimization of the parametric body model, the human mesh in this case, and the um, object mesh. Okay, sorry about these updates. So the key idea is to jointly reconstruct the human and object simultaneously and to use the network to learn the spatial arrange arrangement priors condition on the input image instead of using handcrafted rules as prior work had done. 
And in the interest of time, I'm not going to get into more detail. If you're interested, I um, suggest that you come by the poster and you talk to us um, during the conference. Um, I can show you here like the comparison with um, FOSA, which was a method that was published at DCCB uh, 2020, which essentially is also, it was one of the first methods trying to capture human and object from single images, but there like the contact and the like the um, relationships from the human and the object are handcrafted. So for example, like um, it's hard coded that a person should sit on a bench or that a person should interact with a particular object in a particular way. And of course, this is very difficult because there's many possible ways that humans can interact with objects. And so it's very difficult to scale. And in contrast, our method um, learns this from data. So it's um, it's less restrictive and leads to significant in both the behave data set and um, in images in the wild from Coco. So for example, like you can see here how um, like this, um, sorry, like this, uh, this reconstruction of the, sorry, I cannot, of the human and the backpack or like the person interacting with the, um, know how I can activate this. Yeah, with the tables is um, is accurately reconstructed. And this is by virtue of, virtue of jointly reconstructing the human and object. And like this, the network can learn the typical configurations. And also there's another trick in the paper that I didn't explain, but it's basically allowing to train a pixel aligned reconstruction method from um, images captured with a perspective camera, which was not possible before. And the trick is also actually very simple and you can use it for, for your projects. So um, the method is not a track, tracking method, but still like we can um, run it frame by frame. So in the middle, we on the left, we show the input image. On the middle, we show the result of FOSA, which is this method that handcrafts the rules. And on the right, we have like our joint reconstruction of um, human and object mesh, and basically you can see that the results are much more stable, especially for the object. Um, and notice that here we don't use any temporal smoothing, so it's remarkable that the results are so stable. So what it's also nice is that it, it um, generalizes to images in the wild. Um, it doesn't work for every single image, but um, for many images, it reconstructs a reasonable human and object configuration, as long as the objects has, have been seen during training, of course. All right, so we've been looking at this um, fitting models to data, the classical way, um, which I described before, um, and I said before that this is prone to local minima. So what we've been doing with these neural field reconstructions is to extract some features such that this um, this minimization between the data and the world observations, um, sorry, between the data observations and the world model, um, said we, we use neural fields such that this um, optimization is, is well behaved. But we haven't changed the mechanisms of the optimization itself. And um, Essentially, what you're doing um, internally when you're optimizing such features, if you have, for example, like um, like fitting point cloud to point cloud or you're fitting the model to images, essentially you're minimizing like a sum of squares error, which can be expressed with this um, dot product here, E of X. X are the parameters of interest and the error is a scalar. And you have like E transpose E, which is basically a vector of residuals that measure how well each point in the model matches um, the actual observation. And ideally you want this error to be as small as possible. And this is a classical nonlinear least squares where you um, extract the gradient, right? With respect to the parameters and then you move in the gradient direction. Now, if we look at the gradient of a particular residual, this is the residual induced by a single vertex in the model, for example. Um, if we look at the math, we see that um, essentially 
um, if we develop this, you will have like the derivative of the error with, with respect to the vertex. This is typically not, um, um, not that problematic. And then you have like the derivative of the uh, vertex with respect to the parameters and then times the local error. So what is important that is that to compute this, um, sorry, what I said before, scratch that, it was wrong. So the, the tricky part here is the derivative of the error with respect to the vertex, because this requires, if you're fitting the model to an image, for example, it requires computing finite dis dis differences in image space, for example, to compute image gradients, which is very local and it's very prone to local minima. And that's why fitting models to images is so difficult, even if you have like very good features. Now we ameliorated this using neural distance fields, but still um, like this optimization is, is very local and it's very prone to, to get stuck into local minima. So also at ECCB, we present a method that addresses this. And I think this is really cool. And it's um, sort of a bit of a paradigm shift in how we fit models to data. And this is called Learn Vertex Descent. And the first author is um, Henry Corona. And you can also talk to him and to us um, during the conference if you're interested in this idea. So the idea is, instead of learning features that are good for optimization, we learn directly how every vertex of the model should shift based on local features extracted at the current image location or the current like point cloud features extracted at the current point in the point cloud. So the key idea is to displace the model vertices towards the ground truth based on deep features. And these deep features, again, like they will be local, but also global, like depending on the receptive field of the neural network. So essentially we are scratching this optimization and we are learning to move towards the ground truth. How does this work? If you have an image, for example, you would extract two, you would extract 2D feature maps. You start with some surface initialization. Initialization will not matter as we will see. And then for every vertex, we project it into the image, we extract a feature, and we have a mapping network G that predicts the optimal displacement towards the ground truth. So essentially we're learning to, for every point in the mesh, we're learning to go home, so to say. So if, you, if one vertex corresponds to the nose, this network will um, learn to, no matter where you are in the image, to slowly go to the, or like quickly go to the, nose for a nose uh, in the image and so basically this is trained for all vertices in the model together so basically you can project and evaluate all these local features and then displace all the vertices of the model towards the ground truth and the cool thing about this is that if you train such model like um, you're not prone to local minima anymore. So here we show like how we can fit a model to this image over here. And we use this learn vertex descent idea. So if we initialize with this post, like you see that the vertices learn to converge to the correct locations. And now if we initialize the model like flipped, this is typically a typical failure case of uh, classical fitting methods. It would never recover. It would never like allow to um, turn 180 degrees because this is like very, um, um, it's very difficult for the, uh, for, for the optimization. It would get stuck into local minima. But with this learn vertex descent, like, like basically the, every vertex moves, takes its own path towards the ground truth and it basically converges to the right solution. So this is exciting. Like here we're showing different initializations, particularly like the last one, like we initialize all the vertices at zero and still like the model learns to grow this towards the solution. So essentially it's, um, you could think of this as of a learned optimization method. And the cool thing is that the, um, the shapes that we obtain are quite detailed. And um, this is typically some problem of human pose and shape estimation methods. All the meshes, look kind of average and therefore they miss the details of the, of the particular shapes and using this method like because every the, the optimization is distributed across all vertices like we can obtain like much more details um with this and we also show that this produces um state of the arts for um for mesh registration so if you, the input is a point cloud you can also extract local features well like combination of local and global features um, using a 
feature extractor that we call um, um, IFNets, Implicit Feature Networks, which is a CDPR 2020 paper from our group. And it basically like, um, like you can also train it such that every 3D vertex converges to the correct target point cloud point. Um, yeah, so if you're interested in model fitting, I, I suggest that you check that paper because it's very simple. It's very quick. Like I, I forgot to mention, but this, um, this, this runs at interactive rates and it's very easy to, to implement and very easy to use. So I think, um, this could be quite useful for a number of uh, problems. Okay, so um, another work that we're presenting at ECCB is um, what we call post NDF. And essentially, we are modeling human post manifolds with neural distance fields. So when we are thinking of neural distance fields, we typically think of using them to model surfaces, 2D surfaces embedded in 3D. Here, we realize that this is more general and we can use the distance, like this um, neural to represent like manifolds in general, like in higher dimensions. And in this case, we focus on the human pose manifold. So essentially, we think that um, the ground truth, the, the true poses, um, so I should mention, like the, the pose is typically parameterized with a bunch of joint angles. And there's many combinations of these joint angles that produce basically rubbish like something that is not a human mesh because like the joint angles are not like correct. Um, but there is a space, right? Within this large um, dimensional space, there's a manifold of um, poses that, um, that correspond to the natural human poses. And what we interpret this, we interpret this manifold uh, with a neural field. So basically we want that for the poses that are correct, that are natural, like that those poses lie on the zero level set of this um, surface, this hypersurface. This will be now not two dimensions, but many more. And we want every pose that is off the surface to be, to have a certain distance from, um, from the manifold. So why do we want to do this? Because now like we're going to have like, um, like this hypersurface where uh, the zero, like the, and we're going to represent this hypersurface using an implicit surface such that the zero level set of this um, this field will correspond to the surface and every other point will not correspond to the surface. And this is interesting because now if we want to, for example, project like a wrong pose to the manifold, we can just take the gradients of this distance field towards the zero level set and correct poses this way, like what we show over here. So again, this is like using ideas that have been um, shown before for surfaces. We use it more general for more generally for um, this higher dimensional manifolds. And uh, yeah, this can be used as a post prior for human pose estimation. Uh, you can use it for denoising. So on the left, you have this observation, which uh, let me play it again, like which is noisy. And um, like in the middle, you can see the result of um, like denoising these observations by taking gradients and pushing these poses towards the zero level set that has been trained using the AMAS data set, which is a data set of human motion um, capture. And you can also use this like traveling along the manifold to basically interpolate two poses. Okay, so um, these methods are essentially focusing on single image reconstruction or capturing from Kinects, um, but this imposes restrictions on the recording volume and also on the time you can record. That's why we also looked at um, capturing human interactions together with the 3D world using um, wearable sensors. So I am used place on the body and a camera to localize the person in the 3D world so that we can basically know where the person is in the building and uh, and the IMUs can be used to recover the, the human pose. And um, yeah, so this is, for example, like these are results from a paper from last year at CBPR 21, which we call human positioning system. And um, all the data is available for research purposes. So if you're interested, you can also check um, our website. 
Okay, so I've been talking about capture methods. This means like given observations, I want to fit like a model to these observations in order to understand better what's going on and then like do further processing. Um, of course, we're also interested in something that, that I call the awakened virtual humans. So we want these humans to not be just the body, just the puppet. We want them to be active and we want them to be able to navigate the 3D world like, like real humans. So that's why we're also looking at um, models that learn to interact with the 3D world in this uh, work at, that we call Couch, which we'll present at DCCB. Um, basically, we trained a model that learns how to sit on a chair. And this very mundane task, it turns out to be a very challenging one. There's many possible ways we can sit on a chair. We can use the right hand or both hands or no hand. and um, so there's a space of possibilities and like uh, the human mesh needs to approach the chair in a correct manner. And this is challenging. And so this is like um, what we show. And the key idea of this uh, work that we show here is that we basically predict, anticipate where the person will contact um, the chair. And then basically like given this um, predicted contact, we predict also the hand trajectory. And then from this hand trajectory, we can derive the pose. So essentially, this is a, a little bit mimicking intuitively how we interact with the world. We plan in terms of where we will interact, what, what we will touch, um, and with which body parts we will touch. Um, so this is emphasizing like um, this point that, that we interact with the world through contacts, and therefore it makes a lot of sense to um, predict which contacts will occur and then predict like the trajectories for the body parts that will actually contact the world, like in this case, the hands and the and the, basically the, the core of the body. Of course, when we're talking about interactions, hands play a very important role. And we also looked at this and we will present a paper, uh, this is CV that is called Touch. And uh, essentially what we do is we learn to correct uh, human object interactions that come, for example, from a tracking method or from noisy data, we learn a prior that given two mesh models, it predicts the most likely um, configuration of the human and the mesh, um, of the human and the human hand and the object mesh. And uh, one um, key difference with prior work that had been looking at this before is that now we look at full sequences. Like um, and this allows to incorporate the temporal dimension into the prediction. So basically, the key idea here is to go away from just discrete contacts to have like a fully continuous contact. So essentially, we predict for every object mesh like the corresponding um, hand point in the in the mesh of the hand, and like this, we obtain a correspondence map and a distance map. So it's basically um, predicting much more information. So this is an object-centric model because like for every um, object point, we find the corresponding um, hand contact, like the corresponding hand mesh point. So how this is obtained is like using ray casting. We cast rays from the object until it in intersects with the hand. And then we store the corresponding, um, the corresponding like, uh, identifier for this human mesh vertex, uh, which is basically the coordinates of this vertex in the canonicals, in the canonical hand space. And we also store the distance from the object to this um, intersection point. Um, and we also in indicate whether there was like, uh, where, whether we hit the surface or not. So this, we have like this, um, this tuple here of these three quantities for every object mesh point. And then essentially um, we are extracting this from noisy data like that might have that might have intersections like what you can see here, or for example, like it might have like wrong contacts. And these are things that typically happen with trackers. And essentially, like we obtain this um, touch field that we uh, that I described before, which is this tuple of three quantities per object mesh point, and then using a point. Um, a point net encoder for spatial, sorry, a spatial temporal auto encoder for um, for these features for every um, time frame. Basically, we learn to predict a touch field that is clean, that is correct. Um, 
And this allows you to fix tracking errors. For example, like you, you might have like an input that is completely erroneous because you have tracking errors, you have um, noise and jitter. And then basically, basically based on this, um, based on this wrong tracking, um, we can correct uh, like this and predict the most likely interaction. So the input is the left sequence, and the on the right we have the corrected um, result. Okay, so to conclude, um, I've shown several works where we combine neural fields with classical model fitting to obtain the best of wo both worlds. Um, uh, sorry, the first uh, first I described box to max mask, which is a method for three D instant segmentation, which leverages bounding boxes that are widely available in a number of data sets in order to obtain dense instant segmentation. Um, so this is cool because now we don't need dense. Uh, um, dense annotations, but we can basically do dense instant segmentation with only bounding box annotations. And then in the second part of the talk, I, I described several methods that use neural fields combined with classical model fitting to obtain the best of both worlds. I've shown how you can change the, use the neural fields, for, neural fields to make fitting uh, more robust, but I have also shown this learned vertex descent, which is basically learning the optimizer, learning to do vertex descent towards the solution. And I think this will be useful for not only human model fitting, but any type of uh, mesh fitting into, into observations. Um, in terms of capturing and modeling and synthesizing human behavior, it's, uh, it's clear that it's a very extremely, it's an extremely challenging problem. And we are only at the very beginning. We're making the first steps towards um, like general, general purpose methods. And so this is a very exciting um, direction. And I'm also very interested in um, this interplay between like um, humans interacting with the three world and um, neural fields. So I'm interested in looking at how we can, for example, build a local mental model of the 3D world while the agents are navigating to, through the 3D world um, and how we can basically adapt, continuously adapt this 3D world uh, model. Um, so I'd like to thank um, to all my students and collaborators. It's really a luxury to be able to work with um, with this team of amazing people um, and also amazing collaborators. So all the credits go to them. And um, finally, like um, if you want to um, check our software, typically uh, we put it all in this uh, the following link. You can find it in our website, which is called Virtual Humans. Um, and I of course acknowledge the um, institutions and funding agencies. Yeah, thank you very much. This is the end of the talk. So uh, let's thanks Professor Girard for a, for his uh, great and wonderful presentation in which of humans. And next we will come to the, the, the exciting award ceremony. Okay, let's welcome uh, Meida who will uh, announce the winner team. Thanks to everyone who participated in the Urban 3D Challenge this year. We have two challenges this year, one for semantic segmentation using Synset Urban Dataset, and the other one for instance segmentation using the Staple 3D Dataset. The awards will be given to the top three teams on the leaderboards for each track. We will provide $1,500 to the first place team, 1,000 to the second place winner and 500 to the third place winner. Without further ado, I will start to announce the winners from the first track for semantic segmentation. The third place is Deep Beat Lab. Their method is named Enhanced Point Transformer. Congrats to all team members in the Deep Beat Lab team. The second place is BBG with method called Mixed Point Based and Voxel Based networks for 3D point cloud processing. Congrats to all the team members in BBG. The first place is USTC Space AI. Their method is called smooth denoising for 3D semantic segmentation. Congrats to all team members in the USTC Space AI. All right, congrats to everyone that's winning the first track 
I will then announce the winners in the second track, for instance, segmentation. The third place is LiDAR 3D. The method is called a dual function point cloud segmentation network. Congrats to all team members in LiDAR 3D. The second place is Musk 3D people. Their method is called Musk 3D for 3D semantic instance segmentation. And they have already released all the source code on their GitHub. Congrats to all the team members in the Musk 3D people. Finally, we have the first place winner for the second track. The team is again BBG with their mixed point-based and uh, voxel-based networks for 3D point cloud processing. Congratulations again to BBG members. All right. Thanks again to everyone that submitted the result to our servers for both tracks. We will soon contact all the winners to get the needed information and deliver the rewards. Okay, uh, so next we will have, we will come to the winner talk. So the first one is from the USTC, that is the USTC Space AI team. So Xingjun, are you here? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, you can share your screen now. Uh, hello, everybody. Today, I'm very glad to be here to make a presentation. Uh, we are students from USTC Space AI Group. And we are honored to, be to win the first prize in this Open 3D Semantic Segmentation competition. The method we use is called Smooth Denoting for 3D Semantic Segmentation. Next, I will give a detailed introduction to the main methods adopted by our team in the competition. First, before prepare, preparing for the competition, we learned that the Sense and Urban dataset is a city scale photo measurement point cloud dataset. So compared with the general 3D point cloud semantic implementation task, we would mainly face the following three challenges. Uh, the first challenge is the long tail distribution of points across categories. Uh, the following two histograms respectively represent represent the number of points for each category in the training and the validation sets. It can be clearly seen that both in the training set and the uh, validation set, the point clouds of buildings have vegetation and the ground account for the majority of the whole data set, while the number of the points of the remaining 10 kinds of labels is very small by comparison. The second challenge we will face is the problem of large category size variance, variance in the data set. Take the following two figures as an example. The building in the first picture accounts for a very large uh, proportion, proportion in the whole thing of point clouds, which is a large size instance. The cast in the second image is clearly a small part of the of the scene due to the, the huge difference in the size of the instances in the data set. We know that common methods can only play a good role in identifying relatively fixed, fixed size instances. Therefore, how to use appropriate methods to identify and segment the instances of different sizes will be an urgent problem to be solved. Uh, the third challenge is that object boundaries are very hard to predict, and there is, exists many noise point, point during prediction. As you can see from the following two, the following, the following two figures, semantic segmentation using the semantic baseline approach results in a large percentage of incorrect predictions at the boundaries, and that condemns many uh, noise points of other categories. Therefore, how to optimize the prediction at the object boundary and reduce the number of noise points is also something we need, we need to think about. This is a general text introduction to the about the challenges. 
we have given the main solutions after thinking about them and uh, applied them to the methods used use in our competition. First, uh, to solve the problem of unbalanced uh, categories, we use the data augmentation and some class balanced uh, losses that are conductive to improving category imbalance. Second, to solve the problem of discontinuity exists in labor prediction, we figured out an uh, efficient post processing uh, algorithm to uh, and applied a uh, contrastive boundary learning loss. And uh, I will explain it in detail later. Last, to further improve the results of semantic segmentation, we applied an ensemble method, which ensembles the result of the second place in last year's competition. Uh, this is the pipeline of our method. And you can see on the far left, uh, here is the point cloud of the input, which is the original urban scene without any processing. After the data augmentation we adopt, data is input into backbone of our method, uh, which adopts the KBCon network structure. And the uh, uh, prediction results are ob obtained. We optimize the prediction results from two aspects. First, uh, we use these three types of loss to reduce the impact causes by data imbalance and other problems. The other is use a contrastive boundary learning loss to optimize boundary and a smooth, a smooth model to post process the prediction results so that they tend to be continuous. Uh, next, I will introduce our methods of each model in detail. The first is data augmentation because the recognition of small size objects such as bike works badly. We need to enhance the, uh, we need to augment the data of small size instances. First of all, we find that uh, small size objects have the following problems. We will take bike as an example, uh, as can be seen from the picture. It is difficult for our eyes to distinguish the objects of small size due to the effect of noise. The second is the error in the labeling of the training site and the validation set. It can be said that the object that is obviously not a bike uh, is labeled as a bike. In addition, some instances of small objects have very sparse point clouds which makes our prediction very difficult. It can be also seen from the following pictures that the shape of the bike is very different and it is difficult for the network to learn a unified shape future. To this end, we use the following method for data augmentation. First, the bike instances collected from the training side are inserted red, uh, randomly into the scene after rotation transformation and the scaling transformation to avoid a gravity constraint. We need to adjust the overall height of the back according to the horizontal height of the ground in the area where the bicycle, where the bicycle is inserted so that the closest height of the bicycle equals to the height of the ground. And to avoid collision constraint, we delineate a cube area for the inserted back. If the area contains a large number of other categories of points, uh, cancel the insertion operation. Uh, this is where well, we uh, visualized the scene before and after the data augmentation. We, can, we have added some back instances to the ground scene. As it turns out, the data augmentation approach has worked for us in identifying small objects, uh, for example, the bike. Uh, next, we will introduce class balanced loss, which we use. The first is weighted cross entropy loss, which, uh, which, adds, which, which adds weight to the CE loss based on the 
proportion of each category. The second is this loss, a uh, set of similarity measure function, which is usually used to calculate the similarity of two samples. Finally, LV max loss, which is the loss function for semantics segmentation uh, evaluation metric IOU. Uh, then we will talk about the loss for optimizing boundary prediction. Uh, the, this loss adopts compar comparative learning for points on the boundary to widen the difference between different cat categories of points on the boundary. As for the definition of boundary points, for any point, if there are other types of points in the region of readers are, that point is a boundary point. Uh, this is the post-processing model we use to, use to make the prediction results as continuous as possible. Uh, first, first of all, select points in tune to be processed. Carry out operation with readers, uh, select points of its k neighbor, and conduct random sampling on these points. If most of the randomly sampled points have the different label uh, with the point to be processed, uh, the subsequent uh, post process processing operation will be carried out. Otherwise, pass to process the next point. The logic is that if the category of the center point is the same as the category of most of the surrounding points, then the points in this branch are basically predicted to be the same label and we consider, uh, we consider them smooth. Otherwise, we need to determine whether it is noise or not. The next step, the next step is to count the categories of all points in the k-nearest neighbor of the processed point. If the neighbor is the number of the points which have the same label with the original label of the processed point ex ex exceeds the uh, uh, threshold M, uh, it is considered that there are enough points of the same kind around the point. And sorry. Um, uh, and there is no need to change its, its label. Otherwise, the point is considered considered as a noise point, and we will change it to the label with the majority in the k nearest label. Uh, this smooth, uh, this smooth makes our prediction results as smooth as possible. That is, the label of this point is consistent with the label of most of the points around it. Uh, this is a virtual picture of the scene obtained after post processing. I compared with the three pictures. We can see that this area uh, in the ground truth basically belongs to the same label and is very smooth. And as you can see from the baseline, there is a lot of noise in the same area, especially the, back, the black line. However, our post-processing method successfully remo removed the black line and uh, significantly reduced the prediction error area. As you can see, our post-processing method works very well. Uh, this is another example. Uh, next, uh, I will introduce some tricks that we use in the computation to improve the results of our methods. Uh, we mainly adopted an ensemble method and uh, conducted <coughs> Ensembles with our original method and the uh, variants of our method. That is, uh, with or without the uh, class balance loss and uh, and uh, CBL loss. And, and uh, the second method 
uh, in the first urban 3D challenge. The final prediction result is obtained by the three methods, method above and the label and the label of each point cloud is predicted respectively. And finally, the result is obtained by voting. Uh, this trick has improved our results to some ex extent. <coughs> Mm. Uh, next, I will introduce uh, some uh, our experience. Uh, our team have always been very interested in uh, 3D point cloud related work and uh, pays close attention to the latest cutting edge uh, developments in related fields. Uh, we note that the Sunset Urban data set is a city scale photo. Uh, photogrammetry uh, point cloud data set and the density and the quality of the symbols are superior to similar uh, data sets that have been released before. We believe that this data set have made great contribution to the development of 3D point cloud semantic understanding in large scenes. Uh, at the same time, we have taken note of the Urban 3D semantic segmentation challenge released uh, with this data set and hope to participate uh, uh, in this competition to deepen the research in the field of 3D point class semantic segmentation. Mm, thanks very much uh, to our advisors, Tian uh, Zhu uh, Jim and her support and help in the process of our competition. We also want to thank the sponsor of the outdoor data center, Sunset Urban, and the challenge. Uh, thank you for your listening. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Xinjin. Yeah, thanks for your presentation. Uh, just one more question that is, uh, I, I noticed that you have used the weighted cross entropy and the dice loss and also the, the uh, low vast of the max. So what is the ratio between these different uh, loss functions? I mean, do you uh, directly add these three uh, loss functions or using another different kind of ratios, different weights, I mean? Uh, the weight we used uh, is according to the propor proportion of the uh, point clouds uh, of, e of each categories. Mm, okay, okay, okay. Okay, thanks for your presentation. And uh, here there is a question here. I mean, uh, the first one is, could you elaborate a little bit more with the room label cases in training data set? Uh, that is to say how you deal with the, the loan labels. Uh, uh, we, we used uh, some, we used the uh, uh, data argumentation and uh, some, uh, some uh, category balanced loss. Okay, uh, here we come to the next question. In the presentation, highlight the small objects such as bikes. However, instead of, instead the category real gains the best accuracy among others. So I, I think the question is why you get such good results on the real category? Uh, yes, uh, we get such, such good results is, is by using the uh, post processing, uh, named the smooth model module. Okay. Okay. Thanks for your answer. And uh, if you have uh, any further questions, so please uh, contact Xinjun for more details. And we're also looking forward uh, for Xinjun's report. Okay, uh, due to the time limit, maybe uh, uh, we need to transition to the next speaker. So, so here we come to the, uh, the, second, the second winner, uh, that is the BBG team.
So I think he's Ze Chan will do the presentation. So are you here, Ze Chan? Hi, everyone. Greetings from Singapore. And uh, allow me to share my screen first. So hi, everyone. Uh, sorry for the delay. And uh, uh, with great pleasure, we, we BBG team are very glad to join this uh, Sunset Urban at ECCV 2022, the 3D semantic segmentation of the urban scale point cloud. Uh, so today I'm going to present our um, winning solution, which is the mixed point based and the voxel based networks for the 3D uh, point cloud processing. So allow me to introduce our team member first, uh, who, who are Wei Ze Qiang, Jing Kai, and me, Ang Li Yang, and uh, Gao Mingzhi, Song Kuan, and also Zhou Xiu Zhuang, uh, who come from Beijing University of Post and the Telecommunications and the Big O Technology Company, and also Gago Incorporation of China, respectively. So to start with, we also, uh, you might being already familiar with the Sunset Urban Dataset already, but uh, we still can have a quick glance at it. As we could see, it's a large scale point cloud dataset, which comes from uh, 13 categories of semantic labels, and uh, which also uh, we, we found there's imbalanced class distribution uh, in both the training dataset and also the testing dataset. So, uh, according to this uh, data set we've got. And uh, uh, as you might want to know, we are uh, doing this uh, direction in a long-term way. So we also participated the competition in last year, ICCV 2021. And uh, uh, we would like to uh, introduce our work continuously. And uh, so uh, we might have this community to find more about our progress and uh, the uh, new thoughts we came up with. So first we uh, revisit our last year's winning solutions very fast. So uh, as for the baseline in the last year's competition, we use the RAND LA net and the CGA net, as you can refer to the original papers from CVPR website, respectively. And uh, to be specific for the lost choices, we use the class balance the softmax cross entropy loss and uh, uh, conduct the semantic downsampling strategy as well and uh, choose 0 0.2 as our uh, voxel size in the experiments and uh, as well as the input number is 4096. So in the end, the uh, in the competition, we finally gained the 68.7 MIOU on the leaderboard and uh, we ranked the uh, first place in last year. So this year we also have some new findings and uh, new thoughts. So uh, for this competition, it comes to us is, le is that how can we improve the performance of semantic segmentation of such uh, point class data set? And the second challenges for us is how do we deal with the geometry and the semantic information loss, which are caused, uh, greatly caused by the grid or the voxel? So uh, to, to start with the first part, which is more intuitive, because for the performance improvement, uh, we consider uh, basically for better loss function, better augmentation uh, tricks, and also better training strategies. So to be specific, uh, for the first part, for the loss part, children, which we've chosen the, the uh, CB loss, so-called the class balanced loss and also the dice loss and the low vast loss. So, um, and as for the data augmentation and uh, also the training strategies, we um, refer greatly from the point next, which is also a great archive paperwork published. You, you can um, refer to the further details afterwards. And uh, uh, we refer to their, the, the point next data augmentation, such as random cropping, jittering, flittering, and the uh, Z-axis uh, rotation. And also as for the color augmentation, um, there's also certain uh, certain operations such as random dropout and the jittering and also contrast. And uh, as for the uh, training methods, uh, we, we set up our optimizer as Adam W and uh, also the 
learning rate scheduler, a call sign annual learning uh, scheduler with certain uh, specific weight decay and uh, initial learning weight. And we train our models for 300 epochs, uh, as you might be interested about the training details. So this part is about how do we improve the overall performance of the semantic segmentation. Then uh, the next part will be a little bit tricky. It's like we already knew the grade and the voxel process. Um, but how can we deal with the uh, information loss? So for us, our idea is to mix the point-based network and also the voxel-based network. So let me give a brief. So firstly, you, like the voxelation itself, the voxel process can help to reduce the input scale of the large scale point clouds and also improve the speed of training um, and also the inference speed, as you might know. But it will inevitably lead to the loss of certain, the, certain ge geometric and the semantic information, as long as you have a relatively large um, uh, grade size, right? So an intuitive idea is to uh, reduce the size of the grade. Say we originally have the 0 0.2 million and we scale them 10 times down, but uh, also uh, referred by the point next, uh, we, know, we already know that the range of the input point clouds, they, has a di di they have a direct impact on the segmentation results. So in order to maintain the same input size with the large grid data, uh, it will bring a problem, which is the computation cost will be uh, sky high. So considering this, uh, we do the paper research and uh, we also do some experimental analysis and uh, we, we got inspired by the SPVC and, and, and also the fast point transformer, these two prior works. Uh, then we choose the uh, EQNet instead of last year's RAND LA net as our uh, baseline. Then we uh, modified the EQ net by adding point embeddings relative to the uh, grade centers. Um, and uh, here is the special notice, like uh, um, we use a different baseline model than last year because we found there's a certain conflict uh, with the pipeline of RAND LA net, the whole processing pipeline. And uh, due to the time limit and uh, other concerns, we cannot guarantee that this method will also work on the Sunset urban data set. So we go directly to do our experiments on the voxel-based method. And in the future work, we also would like to merge uh, this uh, voxel-based EQ net with the RAND LA net to do the further enhancement and improvement. So let me brief you in, into this um, uh, into this voxelization process. So it is quite intuitive as we obtain the original point cloud groups, right, the data, and uh, then we do um, a centroid aware voxelization uh, based on their coordinates and their features. And we will have the uh, voxel point feature, uh, voxel point cloud features. Then we further input them into either UNet network or our uh, EQ net or other networks you prefer. Then we do the further feature extractions and the learnings. Then it will output the same uh, voxel features for us. Then um, the voxel features can also be uh, devoxelizations into the original point clouds form. So we now will obtain the final uh, point clouds, but updated features for the further segmentation or other uh, classifier head. So this is a uh, idea. And as for the details, it comes also. So uh, initially we'll have groups of the point clouds uh, points as P with their features I, and uh, uh, we do certain voxelization to uh, to to create a centroid for for this, and also we also create the uh, voxel features, and then we learn in the 
our backbone networks, then it will give us the uh, voxel learnable features and the way then trans trans back then we transpect those voxel features back to the original point sets and the way predict the uh, uh, point sets as the segmentation map or classifier. Yeah, so um, this is a quite intuitive and uh, a simple pass. And also as for some uh, data pre-processing, uh, we actually took the uh, sliding window size, also the also noted as a step, so 20 by 20 to get the examples. And uh, uh, for the voxel size, you might want to know we keep it as 0 0.2 million. And uh, also during the inference phase, uh, we do the overlap in inferencing with uh, step size as uh, 10M. And uh, we also further use some Gaussian function to weight it. it. So, um, and uh, so in the end, end but not last, uh, our, our experiments results shows uh, the RAND LA net would be still uh, very powerful at those small objects recognition and the segmentation, as you can refer to the bridge and the bikes, those small objects categories. However, we also find that EQ net, these networks are beneficial to those uh, rectangle shaped and the long shape and also large space occupied objects such as walls and the rails, uh, these networks, the, the learning way of this EQ net can be very helpful for those kind of categories. So each, um, each of those networks has its own advantages. So uh, in the final results reporting, we also able, we also managed to ensemble the uh, results of RAND LA net and uh, EQ net. Then we uh, finally marked uh, 73.10 uh, in the leaderboard. So um, as we've mentioned, uh, not just uh, participating in this competition, but we also want to uh, further, discuss, uh, further uh, discover this uh, track and also hope to contribute more to uh, the 3D point clouds uh, related tasks. So we also managed to have some uh, future plans and uh, some inspiring thoughts for your reference. So the first is about our next step works. Hopefully we, we, we would like to extend our exploration so that uh, we can uh, extend them into more all voxel-based methods and uh, apply them to the large-scale point cloud applications, make them more efficient and also useful. And uh, the second would be, uh, we, we also would like to try to merge the point-based and the voxel-based uh, networks or those mechanism actually to a unified end-to-end -end pipeline because so far we see for uh, for a certain limit, we are unable to accomplish it. But we do find this uh, combination may have great potential. So we also would like to uh, do the tryout. And uh, the others are also some of the interesting findings we, we might have during this uh, competitions and the with we would like to share with all of the audience. So the first would be the uh, transformer. The transformer is more likely to have greater potential in handling point cloud data. Um, and uh, so far we've already uh, seen several uh, significant transformer works and uh, we hope it can also bring benefits to uh, the point cloud data processing. And the second is like, uh, uh, we, we would like to uh, adaptively select the key points to down sampling stage so we can keep both the efficiency and also improve the uh, accuracy to take care of the performance. And uh, the third part is uh, comes from our observation of the data set itself. So uh, we noticed that now the mainstream, they normally use the Euclidean distance uh, to do the positional encoding, right? But uh, uh, from what we observe is that the geometric shape and also the information comes from the object surface could also bring some more benefits and some structural informations for this uh, 
uh, for for the uh, next step processing. So this would be some uh, of our uh, insights and also about our future plan. And uh, uh, that be all for this uh, short briefing. And uh, thank you all for listening to my presentation. And if you got any questions, feel free to ask me in the following few minutes or reach out to any of our team members uh, in, in the session. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for Angular's uh, presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, so please uh, type on the chat box. Okay, so uh, maybe I can raise a question first. So I, I'm just wondering, uh, do your team plan to write a, a technical report or a paper based on the results or based on the algorithms? Okay. Do you have any plan yet? Yeah, I think we do have a great hope to write a technical report or a paper perhaps. Yeah, but the, the follow-up steps will be uh, uh, further discussed uh, in the next few days perhaps. Okay, okay. And uh, maybe the next question is that since you also, uh, your team also participates the instance segmentation track. So, uh, I mean, the based on the same uh, backbone for the semantic segmentation? I mean, for your next presentation. Okay, yeah, you you guys might also see me again soon, but <laughs> yeah. Um, Is the but, same method or like uh, different methods? Uh, no, it would, it would not be the identical method. I mean, some strategies uh, and uh, some the augmentations, we might share some common sense for the different tasks, right? But we still have different backbones and different networks to do the separate uh, tasks. But uh, um, I hope some of our uh, the common sense, the, the advantages from both these methods can bring some insights to, to the general point cloud data processing. Okay, okay, cool. So looking forward to your next presentation. Okay. Sure. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. So due to the time limitation, so we will have the the next uh winner talk. I think that is from uh Yan Shu. So are you here? Uh hello, hello. Um uh Yan Shu is busy, so uh I, I will replace him to do this presentation. Okay, cool. Uh, so you can start now. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Gao Jiantao, a PhD student from the Research Institute of USA Engineering, Shanghai University. I'm glad to be here to represent our team to introduce our method for the urban 3D challenge. Our team is composed of Yan Shu, Gao Jiantao, Li Zhuo, Li Zheng, Peng Yan, Chui Shu Guan, from Finney, the Chinese University of Hong Kong, Shenzhen, Research Institute of USW, Shanghai University. Uh, our method is called Enhanced Point Transformer. In this presentation, I will introduce our solution from this space. There are background, methodology, and experiment results. Uh, let's start the background information with uh, the introduction of the dataset. The Sunset Urban Dataset collects point clouds across three cities, which contains 3 billion points in 7.6 square kilometer area. There are 30 categories in the dataset, and one needs to identify them in a point-wise level. Each point has its special ordinate and color information. The main challenge of this task is data imbalance. The data distribution of different cities is quite different. In each city, the large target like ground and uh, building uh, occupy merging or place, and the small target like bike only contains several thousand points. Therefore, how to solve the data imbalance problem is important to this task. In this solution, we chose point transformer as the baseline model. 
because of its superior performance on several 3D datasets, such as classification, part segmentation, and semantic segmentation. Point transformer is composed of several point transformer layer. The layer is based on vector shelf attention. It uses the subtraction relation and add a position embedding uh, sigma to both the attention vector uh, gamma and the transform feature alpha. The network framework of point transformer is shown in this figure. It utilizes the UNet structure, which contains five encoder and decoder layers, and each encoder layer down sample one quarter points and through residual block. More details of the network, such as the number of channel, the number of neighborhood samples, and the, the number of residual block, um, can be seen as follow. Since each scene contains an extremely large number of points. It is impossible to input the points of a scene in one time. Therefore, we chop the original uh, data block into 100 times 100 sub blocks. For a small area containing less than 100,000 points, we merge them with the adjacent block. Furthermore, we voxelize the sub blocks to further reduce calculation burden. To deal with the data imbalance problem, we utilize the weighted cross entropy loss and the lower soft max loss during the training phase. For the training data, we use traditional data augmentation methods like random scale, random rotate, uh, and so on. In addition, we also adopted the mixed 3D data augmentation method to avoid overfitting. During the training phase, we set the voxel size as 0.2 meter, and we train the model with 100 epochs, and each epoch repeats five loops for each subbrook. The initial learning rate is set to 0.2 and drop to 10% for every 30 epochs. The base size is set to 8 by using four GPUs and the whole training process cost about three days. On the inference stage, the multiple text time augmentation is conducted, including random sampling and the random rotation. The final output is calculated by averaging multiple text results. Um, then uh, we will move on to the experiment result. As shown in this figure, our, fig our final model achieved 72% mean IOU on urban 3D text data set, linking third among all methods. This, pre uh, this table presents the experiment result of uh, the aberration study for our model. It can be observed that small voxel size WCE lower soft max loss can improve the performance well. In addition, Mixed3D and TTA can also bring some improvements for the model performance. Uh, last, let me introduce our group, DB Lab and Jinghai USW. Professor Li is the supervisor for the DB Lab, and Professor Peng is my supervisor for the Jinghai USW. We have a lot of projects about 3D point clouds and autonomous driving. We welcome visiting students and new PhD. For more information, you can scan this QR code. Uh, okay, that's all my presentation. Uh, thanks to you and other members in Urban 3D Texas for such excellent work. Uh, thanks for watching. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jintao. Thank you for your comprehensive presentation. So first, we will see if uh, anyone want, wants to ask question on the chat board? Maybe I will read the question first. So uh, from the results, okay, uh, from the, the ablation study uh, page, I, yeah. So it seems that um, the loss function plays a very important role. And also um, the argumentation. So, so uh, 
what 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 is the TTA meaning? The test time adaptation. Uh, uh, it means uh, 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 before the data input, uh, we will use uh random sampling and random retage to the input uh data, and then use the data after augmentation, uh, to uh to the model inference, uh, and then we will. We were averaging the uh, each uh, each uh, text result after augmentation uh, to get final output. Okay, 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 got it. Okay, uh, okay. Thanks for your presentation, and uh, looking forward to see your team's report. Okay. 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 That's okay. Um. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And then, uh, we will come to the next track. Okay. We will invite Angula again for the presentation of the winner team for the instant segmentation track. Okay. Thank you for. Hello. Nice oh. to see you again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice to see you. Nice to see all of you again. And uh, yeah, uh, everybody keep a hand on there. And uh, uh, I ensure you there will be also some other exciting points from our instance uh, segmentation networks. Though we share some of those augmentation training strategies, but uh, I ensure you, you can also gain some more uh, insights out from this uh, uh, this presentation. So, okay, here again, uh, greetings from our team, BBG, and uh, thanks for Qingyong and uh, uh, Meida for, and every professor and every audience here. Um, so we are glad to present our championship winning solutions, the mixed point-based and the voxel-based networks. Uh, for the 3D point cloud processing and uh, our team member will be the still the same, Ze Qiang and uh, Jing Kai and uh, me, Anglia, and also Gao Mingzhi, Song Kuan, and uh, Zhou Xiuzhuang is our uh, supervisor professor. So uh, let's get, get ahead with the uh, data set as well, the first, first step. So the uh, STPLS 3D data set is a massive point cloud data set, which um, richly annotated with the large scale photography point cloud. And uh, they will also have the synthetic data. And as you might want to know, they have uh, 18 semantic categories and also uh, four, 14 classes for the instance segmentation. And uh, as for the data set details, you can also refer to uh, Meida and the uh, Qingyong's uh, archive archive paper, uh, which has been re recently published. Okay, so it will also for each competition, we will ask about ourselves first. So what, uh, what are the challenges for this term? So still the first one is uh, for this instance segmentation. Uh, now is uh, how do we effectively, um, okay. Oh, so you guys, you can still see my screen, right? Okay. Yes. Okay, so I'll continue. So uh, first question is still, how do we effectively train and inference the urban scale point cloud instance segmentation? So not just the, about the performance, right? The performance will still be important. Uh, it will be one of our main concerns, but we also try to figure out how can we effectively do these two process? And uh, the second is also how to further improve our performance of the instance segmentation uh, with the uh, point cloud data set. So um, for the first, for the efficiency concern in this case, uh, for instance segmentation task, now we choose the soft group as our um, baseline network for the improvement. Uh, I will give you a briefing about the uh, software group works. 
Okay, so here's our baseline, uh, the, the soft group networks. So the soft group architectures, they, uh, they are rather intuitive, consist of the bottom-up grouping with the UNET and also the semantic branch and the offset learning branch and uh, use the soft grouping, which is the um, uh, soft labeling or soft scoring uh, technique. Uh, to predict the class instead of the one hot classifier hard encoding, right? And uh, then we will have the, uh, then it will have the instance proposals and uh, then it can be fed into the top-down refinement to do the further uh, fine tuning and the detail refining and uh, to uh, connect to tiny unit for further feature extraction and uh, then uh, uh, con concave to the segmentation head to finally predict our uh, instance class labels. So uh, despite of the network design and also their uh, soft labeling design, we also find out uh, for the current state-of-art networks, um, you will see the soft group can maintain a great balance between the performance and also the uh, inference speed, so the efficiency. So we choose soft group as our um, uh, competition baseline. And uh, the next step is we considering also the hyperparameters and the training strategies. And uh, here we also would release uh, all these details for your interest if you'd like to replicate the work. So firstly, we uh, train the uh, whole thing on uh, eight NVIDIA uh, 1080 Titan cards. So, yeah, and the, the, the training includes two stage, stages. The first is to uh, train the semantic and the offset branch. And the, the second stage is to training the semantic and the offset and with also the instance branch. So the, all the branches together for the uh, second stage training and the refining. So as for the um, detail parameters, uh, we choose the semantic vo voxel size as 0 0.1 and uh, the certain spatial shape. Uh, we find out the smaller voxel size uh, in this competition and in this uh, baseline would be better. And uh, as for the instance voxel size and the spatial shape uh, as follows, for these parameters, we find they are not sensitive to the final re result reporting. So we keep it the default values. And uh, as for the batch size, as you could see, uh, it, each card is six samples. So uh, a six by eight, 48 total for the first and the second stage training. So that's as for the batch size and the, uh, the specific about learning rate during the first stage. And also we cut it half during the uh, second stage as you might uh, be interested in the detail settings. So um, as for the uh, training strategies, uh, we, also point, uh, we also borrowed certain uh, sorts from prior works, the point next, uh, as I've introduced a little bit from the last sharing session. And uh, you know, we find that the point next can and can have more efficient augmentation methods and uh, their training strategies would be also useful. So still, uh, this will be the same and the sharing among our semantic segmentation and also instance segmentation. So we do all those data augmentation and the color augmentation. Uh, for, for, for the data augmentation part for the processing. And uh, as for the training strategies, uh, we, we still use the Adam W optimizer and uh, the same uh, scheduler. And for the first the training strategies, we train, we train it for 400 epochs. And for the second instance uh, training strategies, uh, we trained it for uh, 600 more epochs. So um, part, part of that, uh, we also refer to the point group and the DKNet, another uh, two 
pioneer works and uh, add some more useful loss functions here. So for the semantic part, for the semantic part, we use the uh, class balance loss instead of the weighted cross entropy loss here. And uh, so for the offsetting, uh, offsetting part, we, we further added the direction loss to guide the direction. And uh, also for the uh, final one, the semantic and the instance part, we further add the dice loss for the uh, performance improvement. So um, answering about the efficiency and a part of the uh, performance now is also still performance is the most uh, uh, important part for us. So uh, this part you might get familiar with is uh, to compensate the voxel information loss, we reuse the point information in the semantic and uh, offset heads as I will elaborate. So the same figure you might see is uh, we still do the uh, voxelization and the devoxelizations to uh, the original uh, point clouds data data and uh, uh, this is also inspired by the fast point transformer um, the uh, the processing and uh, we modified the uh, soft group the the baseline and also our backbone by adding those uh, point embedding pro process. So we can do the uh, voxel features to learn more useful information for the structure. So uh, as you could see, the same process here is to uh, put in the uh, point clouds features. Uh, then we do, we find the centroids and then we will have the voxel features and the voxel features and voxel features would be learned uh, in the software groups, backbone networks. Uh, and then uh, the, the, lear the learned uh, voxel features will then devoxelization back to the point clouds. Then uh, we will do the final semantic, uh, then we will do the final instance uh, segmentation, right? And, yeah, and we will do the final uh, segmentation. And uh, as you could also, uh, you do also notice that uh, we experimentally find that uh, the embedding is only useful for the semantic branch and it even has a counter effect on the offset branch. So this, um, this uh, simple original coordinates uh, will, will have offset, uh, this will help the offset branch uh, significantly. Uh, so we just keep it the, the original. So uh, as you might want to compare with our soft group baseline, we managed to have the 69.4 uh, MIOU in the uh, testing results reporting. And but with the baseline plus the embedding process, the voxelization devoxelization process, we are managed to reach uh, seventy point one in the in the uh, te in the inference stage. So, um, and now we we also uh, now we uh, now we've already seen the uh, voxelization, right? But uh, furthermore, for this instance segmentation, we also adding one more step is to do the multi-scale clustering uh, for the for a certain radius. So uh, we compared the our the data set, the competition data set with a common indoor point cloud data set uh, such as ScanNet. And uh, we find the uh, inst instance size and also the point numbers among different categories of these urban scale point clouds they are more obvious as shown in the following table. So you could see the uh, huge difference. So um, we statistically uh, to do the clustering uh, after the offset uh, for those uh, different categories in our training data set. And, uh, we, and we set a specific clustering radius respectively for each category during the uh, during the inference stage, as you could 
as you could see. And uh, uh, this clustering also helped to further improve our uh, instant segmentation results, as, as you could see. And uh, uh, the final and last uh, tricks is about the inference part. So the, in the inference part for the competition, we also do the model soup and the TTA as, uh, uh, as uh, previously mentioned, the testing time augmentation, right? So uh, we could see each step, they does make sense. Uh, so we, to be specific, we selected the 10 models with the highest validation results in the last 50 epochs. And we averaged the, the weights to obtain the model soup model. This is about the model soup part. And uh, also since the uh, uh, soft group contains two segmentation strategies, like the uh, semantic part and the instance part, uh, we only carry out the TTA, so the augmentation operations uh, in the semantic segmentation stage. This is for uh, specific details. And uh, our opt-in point features and uh, the semantic logics are averaged, but the offset must not be averaged as you, you might know the offset should be more accurate and should be more precise, but not averaged or distracted, right? So uh, the experiments show that uh, the, the uh, average of the offset will cause serious performance loss. Uh, this might be uh, intriguing for you. And uh, then about the point features, uh, semantic logic or doing those uh, processing mentioned and the offsets are then finally fed into the tiny unit for the final instance segmentation. And uh, as you could see uh, with the baseline, we have 59 and uh, with the model soup, we have 59.3 and uh, with further TTA, we can reach 60.8, uh, the MAP. And uh, also uh, we, as we mentioned, we we are quite interested in this uh, domain, and we uh, we are dedicated to do the further contributions with uh, every one of our peers and uh, the community members and the researchers, students. So uh, we also plan to do some future works uh, beyond this competition itself. So first is that uh, with uh, existing data preparation methods, we find it inevitable that there are wrong offset labels. Some of our uh, presenters might also mention uh, in, but of course, in other competitions, which uh, this will generally does not occur into the indoor point cloud data set. So they are different uh, data set, right? But uh, um, uh, so we might consider to take the whole things uh, in this indoor point cloud data set as our inputs. And uh, we, we also would like to explore where this affect the learning of, of our offset branch in the end, uh, as you could see the illustration here. So uh, intuitively for, for this object, the red circle and the uh, the, the center of this red, red circle should be in the middle of this uh, whole picture, right? But uh, when you took this, uh, uh, when you took this offset and uh, this uh, voxel things, you are inevitably find there will be some fake labels. So we are trying to uh, avoid that to give, to have a global view, uh, let's say uh, the global, the, the whole picture view, the whole thing view. So uh, we wonder whether that will help for those indoor point cloud data set. And uh, the second is about the clustering. Uh, we noticed uh, uh, for, for those uh, competitions, we use the clustering operations, uh, but now they has been gradually abandoned by the researchers due to its non-differentiability and the sensitivity to the uh, hyperparameters tuning, right? Uh, so we plan to do more adaptively and also differentiable operations to replace the clustering. And uh, we've already 
find out some pioneer work, such as Daiko Treaty and the Mask Treaty. They did some um, front end tryout, and we also would like to uh, try with that to see whether we have an optimal way to replace the current uh, clustering operations. But we we all but also we can um, have. Uh, performance improvement. So yeah, that be all for my presentation and for the BBG's uh, presentation. And uh, thanks everyone again. Uh, if you the same, if you have any questions, feel free to ask me now or uh, afterwards. You can reach any one of us through the uh, emails left behind. Thank you. Thank you, Angulia. Thank you. And uh, I will wait to see if there is any question. Sure. And I also have noticed that from the results, and I can see um, your method has super real results on, on several categories, which is the medium vegetation, and also like the the bike, yeah, and also true. the motorcycle, and the, and and the, obviously the street sign, each outperforms other methods by a very large margin. So can you do you have any idea why these categories can achieve a significant uh, performance improvement compared with other categories? Um, yeah. Um... As for the competition strategies, uh, we do notice that there will be uh, the categories imbalance, right, in the data set. And also, um, uh, we, 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 we've, we've, uh, we assume that those small objects, the segmentation results, would be uh, important for, uh, for for the whole picture, for the I mean the mean accuracy or the mean final results. So we did uh, those. Uh, uh, we 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 did take the smaller voxel size for these uh, very specific small uh, object categories, and we also uh, for these uh, uh, each categories we set the uh, radius according to our report. Set the radius respectively. So I think this. Uh, uh, specific operations may help for the uh, small objects, but also in the future, we, we can also do the further discussion to uh, explore okay. more rather than, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, personally, I would like to ask if you can write a detailed technique report, and that would be very helpful and uh, to analyze and this can, uh, kind of like ablation studies. Okay. Thank you. Sure, we'll have a, a team discussion and uh, we will let you know as soon as possible of our technical report progress. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Hi, Bo, do you have any question? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for your amazing uh, results on both tracks. Uh, well, uh, I just have a very simple uh, question. So you have... Uh, uh, conduct experiments on two, tra two tracks in which semantic segmentation are required, the first and the second, right? So from your experiences, um, is there any differences that uh, if you want to improve the semantic segmentation re uh, accuracy? Um, pardon? Um... I mean, uh, the first track, it's only for semantic segmentation, right? Yeah. And the second track, you need semantic segmentation and also instance segmentation as well. That's true. Uh, so so uh, from your experience, so uh, what are the differences? Like when you're trained with uh, instance labels to predict, but at the same time, pre you, you want to predict uh, semantic segmentation. Mm. Is it easier or is it <laughs> harder? <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, instance segmentation, of course, would be more challenging because it, uh, not just you need to tell the 
categories, you also need to tell the instance. Uh, so that's why we are also are struggling to find the further post processing, uh, the appropriate post processing. And uh, but for on general, uh, for the training, I say uh, these two works are more or less share most similarities. All right. Uh, so we believe that insulin segmentation itself will help will help semantic segmentation, or uh, not help. Oh, you mean the instant segmentation will uh, will be will, beneficial to the other task, or maybe not? I don't know. I I think uh, the answer might be yes. So the instance with the uh, more detailed semantic informations, it might help for the semantic segmentation itself. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you for your for your teams. That's a, that's great. Great achievements. All right. Yeah, real pleasure. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. And uh, okay. Due to the time limit, and now we will welcome our uh, second winner team, and that is the uh, the Mask Three D team. And uh, let's welcome Jonas. Exactly. Hello. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you can share your screen now. Mm. Okay, okay. Good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then let's start. <laughs> Hi, everyone. And thank you, first of all, for the opportunity to present our work, Mask 3D, Mask Transformer for 3D Instant Segmentation at this workshop. My name is Una Schult, and this is joint work with Francis Engelmann, Alexander Hermanns, Orli Tani, Siyu Tang, and Bastian Neibe. We present a novel transformer-based approach for 3D semantic instant segmentation on point clouds. First of all, I would like to give you a general introduction about in our method mask for D, and then later on we will dive deep into some specifics we developed for the SDPLS 3D dataset. So our method differs significantly from conventional methods for 3D instant segmentation, which mostly rely on a voting grouping-based paradigm. In this example, we show a U-shaped table. Here each point votes for its instant center, depicted as a red big point in the middle. We observe that the center votes can fail for large and irregular shapes. As the center votes are widely spread in the scene, the grouping stage implemented as some hand-tuned distance-based clustering consequently fails and the output and outputs multiple table instances. Instead, our method mask d does not rely on any kind of voting and grouping. All instances in the scene are simultaneously represented as semantic heat maps. We see that the table heat map, for example, has high confidence over the full extent of the instance, which results in a correct prediction. In contrast to modern approaches, which predominantly rely on geometric clustering technique, mask 3D does not rely on any highly 3D specific components, such as center voting and manually tuned distance based clustering. Building on the successes of recent transformer based methods for object detection and image segmentation, we propose the first transformer based approach for 3D instant segmentation. Overall, mask 3D shows very promising results achieving state-of-the-art on a variety of challenging indoor and even outdoor data sets. Our model predicts instance queries that encode semantic and geometric information about each instance in the scene. The key idea is to compute the feature similarity between instance queries and all learned point features. This results in instance heat maps over the entire point cloud. After normalization and thresholding, these heat maps with their associate semantic class yield the final um, semantic instance. We now discuss the overall architecture of MaskRD. We obtain strong multi-scale point features from a sparse convolutional backbone. 
In our case, this is the Minkowski unit. At the core of the model are instance queries, which each should latch onto one instance in the scene and predict the corresponding point level instance mask. To that end, the instance queries are iteratively refined by the transformer decoder, which allows the instance queries to cross attend to point features extracted from the feature backbone and self attend to the other instance queries. This process is repeated for multiple iterations and feature scales yielding the final set of refined instance queries. A mask module consumes the refined instance queries together with the fine-grained point features, and then returns for each query a semantic class and a binary instance mask based on the dot product between the point features and the instance queries. After thresholding to a binarist mask, we obtain instance masks on multiple scales. We mask out the context from the cross-attention. Moreover, after the final binary threshold, we obtain a per point instance mask on full resolution. Next, we take a close look into how we boost mask 3D's performance on STPLS 3D during inference time. Our mask 3D baseline model without any bells and whistles achieves 55.6 MAP on the official validation set. We then observe some failure cases where performance could further be improved. As SCPS 3 ds evaluation protocol evaluates on 50 square meter blocks, evenly cropped from the full city scene, instances are potentially separated into multiple blocks. For example, consider the partial scan of the car at the bottom of the page of the, of the point cloud. Sorry. We therefore feed slightly larger 54 square meter blocks in our model, but only keep the relevant predicted instances of the 50 square meter block. With this simple technique, we boost the performance by 0 0.9 MAP. We moreover increase the overall number of predictions. From the 100 instance queries, we take the most likely 200 semantic class predictions. We argue that this helps to detect instances of classes which are regularly confused. This improves performance by 0 0.3 MAP. Next, we increase the overall number of queries during inference by 60%. This again increased performance by 0 0.3 MAP. A few times, we also observed that similarly looking objects are merged into a single instance, even if they are parts in the input point cloud. We trace this back to mask possibility to attend to the full point cloud, combined with instances which show similar semantics and geometry. As a solution, we propose to apply dbscan on the output instance masks produced by mask d For each of the instance masks individually, dbscan yields spatially contiguous clusters. We treat these dense clusters as new instance masks. Combining all the aforementioned techniques, we gain 1.7 MAP on the initial mask for D baseline. Finally, we then evaluate a model trained on the combined train and validation set on the official test set. We achieve by doing so 62.1 MAP. Finally, we look into models with a smaller voxel size. We observe that such a model performs significantly better on some classes with smaller instances. For example, ESC classes such as bike and motorcycle, where we see a huge improvement when we go from a larger voxel size to a smaller voxel size. We therefore build an ensemble model consisting of the model with a large voxel size and the one with a small voxel size. By combining these two models, we achieve 63.4 MAP on the official benchmark, which is 1.3 MAP better than the model without ensembling. Overall, MaskVD shows very promising results. It outperforms top performing methods on the scanned hidden test set by a large margin of 6 MAP. 
Even on Scanet 200, with an order of magnitude more class categories, it outperforms highly specialized methods by 12 to 4 MAP without any modifications. On STPS 3D, Mask 3D achieves state of the art with a margin of 10.9 MAP on the validation set. We see Mask 3D as an attractive alternative to current voting and grouping based approaches. We prepared a demo page where you can actually try out Mask 3D on your own skins. You can just upload a PLY file of your point cloud, and after a few minutes, you will get back a semantic uh, an instant segmentation of your point cloud. Just try it out on your web page. You also find our technical report on this project page. Thank you for watching. So thank you, Jonas. Uh, thank you for your fantastic presentation. So the visualization there is very good. I'm just wondering you. how you make such a slice. So uh, do you use no. Open3D or, or something else to do the visualiz visualization? Mm -hmm. Um, I exported the um, point clouds and then I rendered them with Blender. That's the reason why you see these nice shadows. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, okay, okay. I think the visualization is really, very good. Yeah. <laughs> and and also you mean you mentioned that you have a website and we can upload mm -hmm. the, the PRY file. So do exactly. you predefine some of the categories? So for example, Mm -hmm. Any kind of indoor environments or indoor 3D thing can process or not? Exactly. So right now we just have one model um, on working on the web page, which is trained on the scanned data set. Uh, for the future, we okay. would like that the user can say which pre-trained model um, he or she wants to use and then gets the prediction out of it. So right okay. now it wouldn't work that great on outdoor scenes because we have this 20 indoor classes only available. Um, for the future, we will have some kind of drop-down list where you can um, take the appropriate data set. Okay, okay. So one mm -hmm. more question. As you mentioned, mm -hmm. that, uh, this is a transformer-based uh, 3D instance segmentation method. And uh, I'm wondering the efficiency of the method. So uh, mm -hmm. as I, if I understand correctly, I think the transformer-based model is usually uh, very large and maybe not very not very efficient. So, have mm -hmm. you uh, considered this kind of problem? Yeah, yeah. We we um, we measured this, and um, a few other methods also evaluated this on a Titan X GPU. So we yeah. followed their way how to to evaluate the speed on the scanned data set. And here we are actually very com um, competitive. Um, I, I do not know the exact numbers anymore, but it belongs to the faster methods. The reason here is actually that the backbone is still a convolutional backbone with the Minkowski implemented in the in Minkowski engine, which takes a lot of, which is very efficient. So only yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Uh, only the, the, the mask module and the transformer decoder is actually, um, um, the, the heavy thing about the algorithm. So it's not that critical. Um, the numbers we report are without post-processing. For sure, if you apply a DB scan or another algorithm on top of um, mask 3D, your performance will drop, your speed will drop. Okay, cool. And one more question is that for your visualization, I I, I hmm? think for the scan that they said, most of the scans are, are partial or and incomplete. Have hmm. you just to do the, do the completion or something in Blender and then visual, uh, then rendering? Because um, I see the I see picture it, is, it, seems it, like uh, it's, it's complete, yeah. Or that exactly. you just uh, choose um, some of yeah. the, mm -hmm. the scans, uh, which is uh, complete, yeah. Um, um, also, ScanNet also provides you with the meshes, so that's the reason why you have very nice surfaces here. Um, yeah, yeah. For STPS, we, do, we don't have um, any meshes included, so we visualized all the points, and here you see also that the yeah oh. you see the, the individual points. Um, yeah, I know you in, mm? enlarge the size of the point, right? Exactly, we we like blow up okay. the points a bit that it's um, it's denser, that's nicer to look at. Exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. It looks very nice. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very Congratulations. much. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
Yeah, I will try your message. Yeah. Yeah, um, the code is uploaded on GitHub, and yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to receive any feedback if this works on your system, and yeah, try it yeah, out. Yeah, fantastic. That would be very interesting yeah, to see. That's great. Thank you. Hi, Paul. Do you have any other question? Oh, hi. Hi, Jonas. Hi. <laughs> Finally, we see a transformer-based uh, instance segmentation method. That's great. We we have waited <laughs> for so long, right? <laughs> and it works so amazing. So uh, uh, from your experience, like you have mm -hmm. run um, experiments on multiple data sets and uh, get uh, very, very good uh, results. So mm -hmm. from your experience, so what is the the major the major challenge when you um, use a transformer for this like large scale or indoor or even city scale data sets? Mm -hmm. like, Many I see. large yeah. objects and small objects, something mm -hmm. like that. I, I definitely see. So one major problem was always GPU memory. And um, to get these really good scores, you have to go to a very low voxelization. So you can run your ablation study on a higher voxelization and you still get compa uh, comparable results. But to really perform well, you have to go really low. Like, for example, scan it, this is two centimeter voxelization, which in turn means you need lots of memory. And for this method, we can only train this, this huge model in the benchmark settings on 48 gigabyte graphic cards. And this is a major limitation, um, to work with this right now. We already, um, experimented with lots of sampling techniques. We, it turned out that you can do lots of sampling during uh, during training and still get very good results. And I think this is one direction where we could maybe move in more to make them more efficient, um, this transformer approaches that they work on smaller hardware because this is a limiting factor right now. Well, that's great. That's great. We are waiting for your next um, project, which will make <laughs> the uh, later work less computational. Yeah. Let's hope less so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't have any other questions. I, I think the results are, are amazing, uh, to be honest. <laughs> Thank you okay. very much. Mm -hmm. All of the teams, oh. I, yes. Okay, maybe maybe I just want to raise another question. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I'm just wondering, do you, do you expect or do you uh, think if there is any other challenge or maybe, for example, if we organize the third Urban 3D workshop, so what do you mm -hmm. expect? We will have some uh, kinds of new challenge. Do you have uh, any suggestions? Yeah. So, um, so um, where, what yeah. I experience in the workshop where I, I like was working most of it actually to make it work was these small instances. <laughs> they, they gave me nightmares. Um, I like this mask PD model was great on big instances like buildings and uh, vehicles, cars, but on uh, instances like bike and motorcycle, it really didn't perform that well. And the other groups showed really amazing results on this kind of instances. And yeah, I scratched my head a lot. But um, I couldn't make it that great. I, I get some gotten some ideas now in the other talks how people made it work, and I'm quite curious to to try it out. If Maskvd also can get to the same performance when you use um, the methods of the other people, other presenters. But this was really challenging, and this is what I very much liked about this challenge. Yeah, yeah, and also uh, since we the, the first Urban 3D workshop, we have the semantic track. And mm -hmm. now we have the instance track. And for, mm -hmm. for next year, I'm, we are thinking about maybe like the panoptic or yeah. maybe, maybe as some kind of like new rendering or something. So we, we haven't decided yeah. yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, but, but currently we just want to ask, uh, yeah. someone or, or for, for example, like you guys, some expert in this area to mm -hmm. ask for some suggestions to determine. Next yep. year, mm -hmm. which we should do, <laughs> what, what we should do, and <laughs> what we should organize. Yeah, mm -hmm. I see. I, I like both ideas, and um, yeah, panoptic segmentation is it's the not logical next candidate in the line. Yeah, and you're yeah, 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 is, yeah. It's ambitious. It's 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 quite quite interesting to see what people come up with in this task. I totally agree. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, if we have uh, maybe the next competition and we will invite you. Yeah, hope you will enjoy yes, our competition. I, yeah. I, will take, I will take definitely a look. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you for your great presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, looking forward to meet you in the near future. Yeah. Yeah, I hope so too. See you. Okay. Bye bye. See you. Bye bye. Uh, since uh, the time is almost uh, at, almost done, so we will uh, come to the the final closing remarks. Okay, so Bo, can you just uh, uh, close the, the the session? Okay, thank you. Uh, we need to we need to end soon. Yeah. Okay. I, okay. So um, thank you all uh, for attending this um, uh, our lecture today. So um, actually this workshop has been held twice in the past three years. And we have attracted and fostered many smart solutions for point cloud understanding at urban scale. So these solutions are very, very creative and incredible to improve the performance and uh, so on. So this was actually impossible from back to five years ago. So, but like many of us, our ambition is much more than improve, simply improve the numbers. We are targeting at solve the true problems at scale and to enable it to be usable in practice. So from this point of view, we believe that there are still many challenges outstanding. For example, we discussed the issues of class imbalance and the cost of annotation and also the computation efficiency. These are our future works for all of us. All right, so this work does not happen magically without the support of uh, Sunset and the USC, USC Institute for Creative Technologies. So first of all, these two uh, organizations providing us the large scale data sets with very accurate annotation. This is actually the core asset for our community, for this workshop, and even beyond, even in the coming years. All right, and we also thank Institute for Creative Technology for providing our generous cash award. This gener- generosity is much appreciated by all of us, and I hope all winners are happy with it. And at least you can buy some uh, good dinners. All right, all right. So next, we would thank our wonderful three keynote speakers. Their, their insights and their research works will definitely give us a very uh, helpful guidance in the future directions and hope that our future research work could be inspired as well. All right, congratulations again for all team winners. And uh, I believe these solutions are so smart and innovative. They absolutely give us the strong feasibility that that the problems can be solved. At least so far, it's very promising, right? So these guys are truly pushing the boundary of our technology. All right, and we also have uh, hundreds of participants and I cannot list all of them. Here, I just use the numbers, but actually behind these numbers are your days of weeks of or even months of hard working and efforts. So you might feel frustrated or disappointed or even not happy with the result. But we hope that this experience could help you to build solid background of technologies and ultimately benefit your future career and research. All right, so lastly, I will thank all our uh, co-organizers, especially Qin Yong and uh, Mei Da. So without your work, it's not possible to have this uh, so great workshop. Actually, this is much more than just publish a single paper by yourself because you guys helped others to publish pub- many papers. So this achievement is much more than a single paper from my point of view. All right. so. Um, now it's time to say goodbye, and uh, but as we planned, more workshops will be organized in the future with more tracks and more diverse research directions. 
and hope all you guys still keep track of our research, this community, and uh, we hope see you soon in next year or maybe very soon. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.